Chapter Twenty Nine. Trials for mages are mandatory and must be done quickly. The use of drugs to keep a mage disoriented tends to be essential to prevent collateral damage. A mage with truth sensing must be there to verify the validity of anything spoken by the defendant. It is one job where even a pale and soul can be warmly welcomed. Trials are quick and to the point. Lawyers lay out the charges and evidence. There are usually only witnesses to review the information. If the mages are found guilty of breaking any laws, they are executed within a few hours of the sentence being passed. There is never any need for character witnesses or pleas for leniency. There is only one verdict for felony level or higher crimes. Magic explained. The words hit me, and I fought to remember to breathe, even as I heard Kelly starting to scream in the other room. I lifted the phone back to my ear, my hand shaking. Marisol, I don't know where she is, where they are, but I'll find them. As soon as I do, I'll call you. Promise. Corey, is something wrong? Do I hear someone screaming? I could hear the stress in her voice. Yes, but that has nothing to do with Joe. I'm here in the city, and she's back at the house. I'll get her. I promise. Let me go, and I'll go find her. Okay, Corey. Her voice quavered, and I thought my soul did too. Yes, I needed to run to find Joe, but I wouldn't risk hurting Marisol for anything. Remember, I love all my girls. You be careful. Call if you need us. I swallowed. I will. Talk to you soon. I disconnected the call and looked at the people in the room, all of whom were looking at me with various levels of curiosity. Taking a deep breath, I sent a text to Joe and Sable via our group text, then to each one individually. Call me ASAP. Nine one one. Answer. I stared at my phone, waiting for something to rekindle the spark of hope in my heart. Corey, Indira asked, starting to move towards me. What is wrong? Are they with Banyarl? I sent to Carolyn, ignoring Indira standing in front of me and the bustle of officers all yelling to enact mage protocols. I'd reviewed those in class, but hadn't paid that much attention to them. No, I asked. Esmir cannot reach them either. His response was almost instant, and I could sense his stress as the information solidified my worry into full-blown panic. Would they be able to find them in chaos or order? I asked as I robotically put the phone away. No. His voice a whisper. Corey. Indira touched my arm. What happened? What's wrong? I turned to look through the mirror, watching the chaos. Wind blew at the officers as Kelly shrieked something about her art, and it wasn't time. I felt a prickle on my skin as I tried to grab my fear and turn it into something usable. We can't get a hold of Joe or Sable. They aren't reachable, or they aren't responding to any calls. I'm sure they are just out having fun or something. She tried to reassure me, and I could see Stephen torn between helping with the air mage and coming over to us. No, something's wrong, I murmured, not looking away from the two police mages struggling to get through the door. Wind kept pushing them back, and Kelly was screaming. Her hair was vaporizing as the officers, armed with syringes, tried to get close enough to her to sedate her. Shit! Get in there! Help them! George snapped, looking at Alexa and me. We can't let her get away. Why didn't she fight before now? Indira just lifted her hands, stepping back into the corner, leaving me there. I instantly became the focus of George's ire. I'll try. Killing her is easier. Stephen pointed out as he stared through the glass window. No, I need her alive for trial. Those families need closure. George said, putting his own phone away and glaring at everyone. My mind swirled with worry, and I tried to convince myself they just forgot to charge their phones. I have to go. Now. The world seemed distant and unreal. All the commotion came from a great distance, as Joe being in danger filtered through my soul. All I could think was, 
I needed to get to Joe, to Sable, to my family. I turned around. The elevators to the garage were down the hall. Yes, sorry. Need you here. We need you to testify as to what you saw. The trial should be tomorrow, George said, his voice horrified as he stared at the officers collapsing on the ground. Shit, do something, Alexin. The glass broke with an explosion of sound. Glass covered my back, but it sliced into others. Do something, Alexin. George roared as the men in the room were clawing for air. I'm trying. Quit distracting me. Stephen snapped as he focused on the woman, but she ducked behind the table, breaking his line of sight. I don't have time for this. I have to go. I said the words numbly. I couldn't take the time to deal with all of this. Joe and Sable were more important than anything else. I gave myself a hard shake to get my mind and body moving and turned towards the door. You can't go. We have to stop her. This time, George was yelling, and I was so tired of people yelling. If taking care of her gave me room to think, to figure out how to get to the house, I'd take care of her. Carolyn, can you come to me? I asked as I changed directions in the hall, going into the next room instead. Part of me registered that Stephen was pulling magic in, trying to disrupt Kelly's pull on the air in the room. Air fighting air, but she already had it listening to her, so he had to offer more. It was getting hard to breathe as the air moved away from my face. It didn't matter. Getting to Joe and Sable did. Power I had in spades, and Bainerl didn't believe in any of us being helpless, but I needed to be able to focus to get to them. With all this going on, I couldn't focus. Even with the mages attacking me, I hadn't felt so terrified. All they could have done was kill me. If someone had Joe or Sable, they might kill them. That was unacceptable. I walked directly towards Kelly. You traitor. Don't you understand? I had to create art. I needed those supplies to create my masterpiece. There were no other options. And everyone knows you need to do trial runs to create what matters. Her eyes were wide, and the feel of offerings being given to air registered to my magic sense, but it didn't matter. All that mattered was shutting her down and getting to Joe. They have to be okay. Please let them be okay. The need to breathe started to sink its claws into my lungs as she backed away from me into the corner, but the previous experiences, the memories, let me push it to the side and continue forward. No, I must see my masterpiece be revealed. She begged as the chair lifted up and flew towards me. I stepped to the side and it sailed into the viewing room. I don't care, I said, with no air in my lungs, though my hair whipped around my head. There was no sound. I made a distant note that she had excellent control of air in general, if overly basic. The need to breathe pounded on me, but it didn't matter as much as getting to Joe. I reached out and laid a hand on her arm. No, don't touch me! She screamed. I almost possessed a shred of sympathy for her. She was either severely deranged or had some other sort of disorder. But the penalty for using magic to kill was death. I sent a knockout pulse through her. None of my college classes covered this, but I'd used it the first time I'd met Special Agent Stephen. I'm being an asshole, Alexant, though I hadn't known it at the time. This aspect of psychic sent a bolt of electrical energy into a person, specifically targeted at disrupting their neural processes. It would knock out anything with electrical impulses to the brain. Baneural had made me practice over and over, convincing Joe and Sable to let me zap them, the headache you got afterward he compensated for with honey and fruits we couldn't get in our world, meaning I knew how to knock you out. Hard. I pumped power into my touch. I needed her down and fast. The electrical charge broke past my skin and into hers, and I could breathe. I heard things around me even as she arched backwards, hair flying up for a brief second. Then she collapsed in a pile. I spun, 
leaving her crumpled in the corner as people freaked out around me, more than one officer looking at me with fear. I reached the door to the hall as George and Stephen got there. George's eyes were wide, but I swear Stephen had the slightest smirk on his face. Problem taken care of. I'll let you know if I can come back for the trial. I need to go, I stated as I moved around them heading to the elevator, calculating the time it would take me to get back there. Time Joe might not have. Could I get on the subway? A cab. I could rent a car. Take Stevens? Carolyn, I'm here, he said, and the warmth of his body soaked through my slacks as he leaned against me. Monroe, you can't leave, George barked at me, and I paused in my beeline to the elevators. Yes, I can. Actually, he's right. You're required by law to stay within 50 miles until sentencing and be available to testify if necessary. Stephen sounded serious as he kept glancing back into the room and the woman lying there being drugged by the recovered police mages. Too bad. I need to leave now. Give me your car keys. My imagination played pictures of them dying due to carbon monoxide or something collapsed in the house and they were trapped or food poisoning. The ways to die filled my head. It was an old house. It could be anything. Weird diseases started coming up in my mind or magical mishaps. And every detailed picture of them dying ramped my stress up higher. I didn't know if I could handle Joe dying on me. I can't lose her like this. I have to be there. Corey, literally I can't. I'm required as an officer of the law to keep you here. I'm sorry, Stephen said, sounding truly remorseful. Indira stuck her head out of the room, looking at me. She had the strangest expression on her face. I'll call. Have some officers check on your friends. But I need you to come with me. Give your full statement and get it filed so we can start processing her. I want her in front of a judge before the drugs wear off. And I want you in the courtroom if she burns them out. It's happened before. I looked at them and weighed their demands. The law's requirement against my need to see Joe and Sable. The argument came out on the law's side, but then I waited against a house that might be magical, against the possibilities they might be hurt or dying, against Joe needing me. The law lost. Your problem, not mine. I'm leaving. I continued towards the elevator. No, you're not. Merlin Alexson, stop her. George ordered, and I saw Stephen sigh. <sighs> Sorry, Corey. You have to stay. He moved towards me, regret in his eyes. I made my decision, and my stress vanished. I reached down and petted Carolyn, and felt him purr. He rose up and put one paw on my arm. I'm sorry, too, I said. Stephen's expression changed to alarm, and as he reached for me, I sidestepped, taking Carolyn with me. Chapter 30 One of the classic children books is The Wizard of Chaos, where young Dorothy, an unrealized Merlin, falls through a rip into the chaos plane. There, she meets a mage who escaped to chaos from a persecution decades ago. Even with the help of the friends she makes along the way, Dorothy will need all of her magic to get home. But will it be soon enough to register for the draft before her family loses everything? House of Emrys Book Review the feeling of reality rushing through me lasted only a fraction of a second, and I found myself facing the house, the car sitting in the driveway, untouched. This both worried and relieved me. Your ability is improving, Carolyn mentioned as he bounded up the steps. Uh-huh, I muttered, shaking my head, then racing after him. I grabbed the door, unconsciously bracing myself to be shocked but it turned in my hand and swung in. Joe? Sable? I yelled out as I crossed into the house, listening for anything. Creaks, moans, groans. The house sounded and felt empty. Carolyn, can you hear anything? No, he muttered into my mind, worry coating the edges of his words. 
Then we search, bottom up. I'd only been carrying the small purse, more for show because my phone was in my pocket. I dropped it on the entry table and headed to the basement stairs. I pulled open the door, calling for them as I flipped on the light and clomped down the stairs, Carolyn moving much faster and quieter ahead of me. The basement had nothing besides some dirty clothes and a few spiders. As always, it felt like I was missing something, but I couldn't see anything. We headed to the back of the house, stepping out on the porch, empty too. Where are they? Part of me knew that if they were in the house, Carolyn would have heard them, but I turned and raced up the stairs, only to come to a screeching halt as I reached the landing. The door to the memento room was shut, but the door to the third level, the one I'd tried to get into only to be told no, was wide open. It swung slowly back and forth, actively taunting. Carolyn? His head lifted, lips drawn back as he scented the air. They were here. I smell them up the stairs. But it ends. He moved a step or two in, but like me, he wasn't eager to go rushing up the stairs. I cannot scent them now. I should be able to. This house is not that large and scents linger. Eyes narrowed. I headed up the stairs and looked into the room. My awareness narrowed down to a single sandal laying on the floor, blue with green beads, the ones Sable had been wearing when we drove up here. I wanted to rush in there, to find them, but if I disappeared here too, Marisol would never know. Fighting my own inclinations, I took a big step back and pulled out my phone. I'm going to let Indira and Stephen know where I am. There will be consequences for what I pulled but they need to know I'm still in the state, and maybe by the time they get here, I'll know something. I hit Indira's name, the phone dialed, but then just disconnected with a no-service message. I frowned and looked at the phone. No signal at all. That's odd. I had a signal the other day. I headed to the balcony, figuring I'd step outside and try again. The door was locked. I looked closer at the knob. Maybe the lock had been flipped, All I could see was the deadbolt up above, but the knob wouldn't even turn in my hand. Any calmness that might have settled in my soul started to boil off. I turned and raced down the stairs, almost falling twice in the new boots. I grabbed the handle of the front door and twisted, but it wouldn't open either. One last chance. I hit the back door and sighed in relief as it opened. I stepped onto the porch, Carolyn at my heels, and I froze. Where not ten minutes earlier there had been a grassy lawn, an orchard, and some empty space that would make a great garden, now there was grayness, a color and thickness that I recognized. Carolyn, can you reach Banyarl or your mother? While I could, I needed to concentrate and think, while for Carolyn it was second nature. He'd be much faster at it than me. His ears laid back against his skull, Eyes closed while his tail lashed. Just when I was starting to get my hope up, he replied, No, there is something blocking me. I have never been unable to contact my Melkin. Ever. I sagged back against the doorframe, staring at the gray. I could sense magic. It felt like a damp, wet blanket all around us. And even in the spirit realm, I never sensed this much magic. I guess it's just us then. I wasn't sure of the swirl of emotions coursing through me, but I grabbed onto the one I could use. Anger. So be it. If magic wants a dragon, magic is going to get a dragon. I looked down at my familiar, my friend, my family. You good with that? Carolyn purred and rubbed against me. My powerful queen, you will show her. Yes, I would. First things first, let's leave a message for my mentors. And I'm not going on a rescue mission in this. I waved at my new clothes. If I'm going hunting for magical jerks, I'm doing it in clothes that I'm not going to freak out at every stain. Besides, I want my boots. I headed for the master bedroom. While I hadn't planned on working as a paramedic while here, habit meant I'd packed my boots and a medium med kit. I'd go prepared to rescue my friends. 
At this point, they'd been missing for almost two days, so me being properly prepared wasn't going to make it worse, and it might just make it better. It took me about an hour. I made sure I ate a huge meal, both of us, almost stuffing myself, but I had a feeling this wouldn't be quick, and I needed to make sure I had energy. I didn't know when I'd get to eat next. I packed my backpack full as I could get it, but still carry it comfortably. Merlin knew what I'd be facing, and I wanted to leave as many clues as I could. When I was ready, a letter lay on the entryway table, and I'd taped a prop open door message facing the outer door. In theory, they should see it before they opened the door, but who knew what would actually happen, or if they'd be able to open the door at all. I'd done what I could. Carolyn and I stood at the base of the stairs, peering up to the door at the top. I had changed into cargo pants, tank top, long sleeve shirt, and my boots. I had filled the backpack with food, water, bowls, med kit, and some extra clothes for everyone. I'd packed a lot of food. If I had to be in there for days, I wanted to make sure hunger didn't make me weak, and it was possible Joe and Sable needed food too. Then there was food for Carolyn, who had graciously agreed to eat tuna or salmon in packets due to the difficulty of packing fresh fish. The only electronics I'd packed had been a flashlight, and I'd tossed in a lighter. You never knew when a bit of flame would come in handy. Plus, I'd crammed in a pair of flip-flops and extra socks, just in case. I left my phone on the desk in the study. It wasn't going to work where I was going anyhow. I suspected I need to use a lot of magic, so I'd taken the time to create 20 tiny braids around my head each with a different colored band. This way, I could just offer sections of the braid as needed. My hair might be horribly choppy later, but I wouldn't have to think or focus on my offering. I still had to focus to make my offering cosmetically pleasing. Getting too used to offering up blood wasn't wise, no matter how much magic liked that offering. We ready? I couldn't take my eyes off the stairs, but I knew Carolyn sat next to me, his tail stroking my legs, on to adventure. I knew I picked the right queens. I snorted. <laughs> you need your fuzzy scalp examined if you think this is something I want. Perhaps, but it is the life you will lead. Starting to climb the stairs, I groaned. Part of me was running around screaming, like I'd just had a millipede climb up my pants, while the rest of me bubbled with a level of excitement and anticipation that surprised me. Either way, I was doing this. I stepped over the threshold and looked around, Carolyn next to me. I peered into the shadowy space. Then, an offended meow and a thump made me jump. I turned. Carolyn was giving the closed door an angry glare. It pushed me. Almost closed my tail. His outrage filtered through as I stared at the door, but the fact that his tail had not been cut off reassured me. Powerful, but not cruel. That was a good sign. I turned back to face the room and froze. I would have sworn not a moment before there had been walls, windows that pointed out to the front of the yard, and a wooden floor that needed some attention. Now, it was all gone. The floor looked more like packed dirt, and the shadows flickered to gray, moving shapes. I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. I muttered, looking around but the only thing I could see was the door standing behind me, no longer attached to a wall. Like that isn't creepy and weird. I looked at the seemingly endless nothingness around me and sighed. <sighs> Any idea which way? Carolyn had his ears laid back, and the gray light made him look browner than his shiny red. No, this place has no smell, and that is wrong. I used my nose as much as any human, which is to say, little, so I couldn't address that. Then forward it is. I took two steps and reached down to pick up Sable's sandal. In the gray light, I turned it over, and it looked like it had just been dropped there. No damage that I could see. I slipped open one of my cargo pockets and slid it in. I contemplated pulling out the flashlight, but the light was just enough that I didn't think the flashlight would help. I glanced behind me, and the door still stood there, alone and creepy in the grayness. 
Do you hear anything? Carolan shook his head as he circled me. Huh. I turned and walked back to the door. Hey, would you sit on this side, please? He flicked an ear at me, but sat there while I walked around it. It just stood there, looking like a normal brown house door. I tried the doorknob from the side we'd come in on, where Carolan sat, and it didn't turn. Acting on a hunch, I went around to the other side and tried. It turned. I pushed it open, and a wooded glade filled the frame of the door. Caroline eeped in my head. That is impressive magic. I see the door opening, but you are not on the other side. He stuck his head around and peered at me, then the other side. Whoever has created this is powerful and anchored. What does anchored mean? I don't know how to explain it. Ask Banyara when you can. I glared at him, but he didn't seem to be avoiding, just more like I would have told someone to ask Joe how an engine worked. I knew it was internal combustion, but more than that, I'd sound like an idiot. We go in? Only place that I can see. I took a deep breath. Ready? He moved next to me, and together we stepped into a realm. Chapter 31 The increase in familiars for archmages is interesting. No one has any hard evidence as to what is driving this, but the stats show a 15% increase in familiars. The next few years of draft may prove very interesting, as mages with familiars are always powerhouses. It greatly expands what a mage can accomplish. Magic Explained Online The familiar feeling of crossing into a realm washed through me, and I paused, focusing. I tried to reach for Banyarl, but I couldn't find him, or even leave a message. I turned to inspect the realm we were in. It took me a bit to see it, but there was a pattern to everything. I'd had enough biology classes to recognize the Fermi pattern and how the trees were placed. We're in order, aren't we? The sound of my voice was almost discordant among the harmony of the leaves, but it felt good to throw a bit of disorder into this place. Even the leaves rustled in patterns. Yes, he hissed in my mind. Too rigid. He stopped mid-tail lash and jerked his head to the left. I sent them. This way. I wanted him to run, but both of us walked slowly, looking for traps or danger lurking. The air smelled like fresh pine, but I winced at the crunch of grass under my feet. I did everything possible to make sure we didn't damage anything that could be avoided, even to dropping to my hands and knees and crawling under some low-hanging branches. I didn't want to do anything to make whoever was doing all of this any more annoyed than they obviously were. Because it was order, getting on my hands and knees, even with the backpack, kept me from doing anything more than disturbing the leaves on the ground. It was just that neat. I followed Carolian, trying to ignore the occasional sharp poke in my knees. There, I see my queens, Carolian murmured. I wanted to ask why he was whispering in my mind, but I didn't. I just finished inching through the gap under the trees and stopped next to him. He crouched, peering at another clearing, It looked very much like the one we had just left. Orderly, neat, and somehow cold. But in this clearing, I could see the figures of Joe and Sable floating in a column of light, Sable missing her left sandal. No matter how badly I wanted to rush out there and grab them, I didn't. I looked around, trying to figure out why I was here. All I saw was a glade with two bodies floating in it. My heart clamped in a vice. Carolian, are they alive? I whispered it in his mind, mainly because to hear those words out loud might destroy me. I believe so. I smell no decay, and there are two very slow heartbeats. It wasn't the instant reassurance I wanted, but it would have to do. I crawled the rest of the way until I was clear of the branches, then stood up and walked towards them. 
I scanned the area as I walked, trying to figure out what else I might be missing. No matter how carefully I sorted through the sounds, I heard nothing but the harmonious leaves, which started to sound even more creepy. My BFF hung suspended in light, looking for all the world like she floated in peaceful sleep. I reached out to touch Joe, needing to make sure she was okay. Her hair floated around her like silken tentacles as she hung there, a look of peace on her face. My hands slid off whatever had them hanging there suspended. I can't even touch her. I stepped back and looked again, but I had no idea how or what was holding them there, much less how to break them out. I walked around again, trying to see if I could sense anything, but all my magic sense told me was magic surrounded us. Not exactly helpful. I stepped back, pondering. Any idea? I asked Carolyn softly. It still felt unwise to be tramping around here. No, but my queen will figure it out. He settled down, facing their floating bodies, but his ears flicked at every noise, tail and whiskers twitching. I resumed inspecting what held my friends. What? No rage or casting magic to get them free? No showing how powerful you are. That voice I'd been hearing in my nightmares filled the clearing, and I pulled myself up a bit straighter. As I didn't see anything by my friends, I pivoted in a slow circle and stopped at about 270 degrees. There stood a form. Humanoid, but swathed in so much swirling gray I couldn't define anything else. Even the voice didn't give me an idea, although assigning gender to realm denizens could get you in trouble. I take it they are bait? Of course. You left. You must pass or fail the test. But you left rather than facing them. That could not be tolerated. I blinked. The being sounded almost petulant, as if I hadn't followed the plan. I looked around at the symmetry surrounding us and felt an odd spurt of hope. Yes, I was called away, but I'm here now. I settled down on the ground and pulled out some of the snacks I'd packed, cheese and nuts. Offering meat when I had no idea what it was might be unwise. Would you like something to eat? Walking through all this beauty has stirred a hunger. I held out the container of nuts and cheese and then set it on the ground. My stomach was clenched up so tight that the idea of food made me want to be sick, not to mention I was still stuffed. But I picked up an almond and popped it in my mouth. The bean froze, then glided over towards me. You are strange. I have your friends. Why do you not threaten me and prove your strength? Are you planning on hurting them right now? I fought to keep my voice level, but my fists clenched as I waited. That depends on you. The bean leaned closer, inspecting the nuts. What else is there? Dried fruit, I said, and reached out to take a dried cranberry and pop it in my mouth. The tartness helped to center me as I bluffed. Do you really want me to attack? Why won't you follow the plan? There was a whine in its voice this time, and the bean stomped a foot, the movement full of exasperation. So be it. It waved its hand, and the three statues from the memento room appeared. See the folly of those who went before you. Can you be what they were not? I shrugged and tried to keep the shivers of terror under control. Since I don't know what they wanted, I can't answer that. I just would like my friends back, safe. I tacked on the last word hurriedly. The last thing I could handle was them coming back hurt because of me. Heralds, I thought they were supposed to be the best she had to offer. But no, I get the dense one. Are you the herald magic once? How do I answer this? I'd always figured honesty was the best policy. Plus, I had no idea what lie would be the right lie for this situation. Besides, you never knew who could truth sense. Probably not. I don't want to be a herald. I don't even really want to be a mage. 
I carefully packed away the food, stalling for time. But it seems I don't really get to choose what I want. I sealed up my backpack and stood. What do I need to do to rescue my friends? And what do you want? The figure froze, and I got the sensation of being exposed from the soul on out. I stood there, feeling more on display than when I was trying on clothes, dressed only in lingerie. Carolyn rose and brushed against me, and I sank my fingers into his fur, letting his existence center me. You are most strange. I want to know my owner is a worthy one. Magic wants to know if you are worthy to wield the power you do. Those with power like you can destroy as easy as they can create. It is a balance, one that must be kept. That actually made much more sense and would explain why so few reemerged mages were being found. If magic wanted to keep a balance, and those people before me were uber-powerful, magic eliminated them when they didn't pass whatever requirements she had. I struggled to swallow past the lump in my throat, but I didn't move or run. I would never abandon Joe or Sable. Okay, so what now? I was proud that my voice didn't shake as I spoke. Behind each of the figures, a rip appeared then widened into a full portal. There are three challenges you must pass. Arrogance, wrath, and avarice. All the emotions I'd seen encapsulated in their statues. Even now, I could almost feel them radiating those emotions. I let out a shaky breath. Okay, what do I do? The figure tilted its head and waved a limb at the rips. Face the challenges, of course. Is that not what heroes do? I laughed. (laughs) I'm not a hero. I'm just Corey. Even as I said the words, the comments that Gar had told me, had it only been four or five hours ago, came flashing back in my mind. You are a paramedic. You save people. If that is not a hero, I do not know what is. Carolyn whispered in my mind. Just Cory that has a griffin teaching her. Just Cory that has Tersane's favor on her neck. Just Cory that has a kit of one of the Chaos Lords. The voice mocked me as she talked. Wait, Esmir is a lord? What does that mean? I blurted. And who are you? Who are you to do magic's bidding? And why is Banyarl teaching me? teaching us so important. The bean stared at Carolyn, who found his paw of great interest and was cleaning it, showing off the razor-sharp claws on each finger. Because you amuse me, and because you are so woefully uninformed, I may answer some of your questions after you successfully defeat the first challenge. I glared at both of them. If acting like a dragon or a Merlin would stop people from not telling me stuff, it was completely worth it. I pulled myself up to my full height, oddly missing those low-heeled boots, and gave it a hard look. Swear you will answer all my questions when I complete the first challenge. Laughter, familiar from the first time, filled the clearing. (laughs) You are amusing. I will answer some of your questions. Some are not mine to answer. Even though it didn't have eyes that I could see, the meaningful stare at my familiar was obvious. Three questions. I countered. Even I knew specifics were very important. Very well. Three. Though refusing to answer a specific question is possible. I narrowed my eyes at the creature, then nodded. Agreed. Excellent. Now please go and don't fail, because you will not turn into a statue. They thought failure meant they would not be beholden to magic, but they would keep what they earned. For you, you will keep what you want, but your friends will die. Remember that, their lives are in your hands. It paused and looked at the three statues. 
Besides, you are not as well dressed as they were. You would be an awful addition to my collection. I sputtered at the insult, then straightened. I am wearing appropriate clothes for adventuring. Pockets are important. Then it dawned what she was saying. And I have no intention of failing. Spending the rest of eternity as a not-dead statue has no appeal. I looked at the mages and shuddered. None at all. Then you must defeat the challenge. The creature just stood there, and I wasn't 100% sure it was even standing on the ground. I will, I said, my smile shaking at the edges. The entire scenario was insane, but for Joe and Sable, I do what I must. Come on, Carolyn, let's go explore the crazy tests. He rose and moved towards me. No, you must fail or succeed on your own. The focus may not assist you. Carolyn hissed, and I clenched my hands to control the shaking. Go in there alone? Without him by my side? I am her focus. I must go with her. Magic says not. She is the one being tested, not you. Your nature is not in doubt. He growled, tail lashing, and sank back down. I will wait here for her to return triumphant. My queen is powerful and will defeat your challenges. We shall see. Choose, Koi Monroe. What do you fear the most? Chapter 32 The OMO released a study on telepathy, a.k.a. mind speech, last week. While familiars have always been able to talk to their mage, most of the time they never talk to anyone else. However, more and more evidence is coming out that this is by choice, not by a bonding connection as originally suggested. It raises concerns that there is a cultural reason behind the familiar's actions, which means they have a society in those other realms, a society that doesn't match ours. Magic explained online. I wasn't about to tell this being that my greatest fear was the two people it had captured being hurt. Instead, I secured my pack and strode towards the portal of wrath. If I was going to fight anyone, I might as well get it over with now. I ignored the weight of the being's regard, while Carolyn's gaze draped over me like a protective blanket. With false bravado, I walked into the portal. The ground between one step and the next was at least six inches lower. I stumbled, falling to one knee, just managing to stop myself from tumbling to the ground. Kneeling there, I looked around the area I'd found myself in. Trees and bushes overhung a path that led deeper into the forest. I rose, rubbing the bruises on my knee, and looked behind me. The entrance was gone. Instead, an impenetrable wall of trees stood behind me, judging me. You're losing it. Trees don't judge. Carolyn? I tried. We'd talked across realms before, but there was no answer this time. That didn't surprise me, though it lowered my already low mood. I shook myself and started down the path to my trial. Whatever that would be. I moved along the path, and I swear every branch, root, and cobweb grabbed at me or tried to trip me, and we won't talk about how many wispy bits of webbing ended up in my mouth. By the time I reached a clearing, I was tired, annoyed, trying very hard to not think about spiders in my hair, and more than a bit frazzled. Sent her. Figure out what the challenge is and get it done and out of here. I looked around the area and realized it wasn't a clearing, but a small town. If you were talking fairy tales or medieval times small town. The houses were all huts with thatched roofs and simple walls. Their windows, where there were any, looked like they had blankets stretched across them. I turned around, not sure what I was looking for, but wanting to get an idea. Six houses, all about the size of my bedroom one bigger house with a stable next to it, and a well in the center. That was it. Where the hell am I? 
And more importantly, what am I supposed to do? An old woman stepped out of the bigger house, a bucket in each hand, headed towards the well. I angled my trajectory to intersect with her. She looked up as I approached, her eyes narrowing, but she didn't stop until she reached the well. Excuse me, ma'am, do you know what I'm supposed to do? She looked up at me and I blinked, realizing she couldn't be much older than 35 or so, but her hair was gray and she had wrinkles that made me cringe. Stupid one, ain't ya? She spat and started to lower the bucket into the well via the hand crank. I sighed and forced a smile. Probably, but if you wouldn't mind explaining it. She spat to one side, then the bucket splashed into the water below. With a heave of effort, she started to crank it up. Let me help, I said. In exchange for the information? Stepping back, she gave me an evil look, but let me crank. Thought you heroes were all smarty. Knows how to save the princess. Why are you asking servant wenches for aid? Her tone and expression a sneer. I grunted. The bucket was heavier than I'd thought, but I kept cranking. I'm supposed to save a princess? And I'm not a hero, just trying to save my friends. I heaved the bucket out of the well and set it down for her. That I doubt. All the same you are. Get out of here. We've nothing for the likes of you. She grabbed the full bucket and started to lug it back to the building she'd come from. The other bucket sat at the well, somehow forlorn. Please? I called. She just made a sign at me that I suspected was somewhere between being flipped off and warded against, which didn't help. Now where? I muttered, looking around the oddly quiet village. Kiss me. And maybe your questions will be answered. You will gain power beyond belief. I spun, trying to figure out who had spoken. Movement grabbed my attention, and I saw a large frog on the edge of the well. Did you just talk? I asked cautiously. I wouldn't be surprised, but acting out fairy tales step for step seemed a bit surreal. See anyone else around, or are you just too stupid to realize it? It responded. I thought about getting annoyed, but since I had a talking cat, I couldn't really blame it. Sorry, so if I kiss you, you'll tell me what I need to know? I clarified. One way to find out. It puckered huge, wet, green lips at me. I almost started laughing, but a simple kiss wasn't that big of a deal. I leaned down and pressed my lips on the frog's lips. They were sticky and cold, and rather reminded me of a pickle. Wow, you really are a moron. The guys will never believe I got you to kiss me. With a huge leap, it sprung away and splashed down into the well, leaving me there with wet, slimy lips. I wiped my lips clean, then rubbed my temples, trying to keep my frustration under control. All I wanted to do was figure out what needed to be done. Letting out a frustrated sigh, I turned to see a man leaning against a tree at the edge of the village, watching me. He wore only leggings, I think they were called trues, and boots. Shirtless, his musculature was struck by a ray of light, making him all but glow with health and vitality. I summoned up a smile and moved towards him. Hi, I was wondering if you could tell me where I'm supposed to go? Though, if I'd been dumped in some random town and not a true scenario, I was going to be here for ages. Are you so desperate you would kiss the creature of the water to gain their favor? He asked once I got closer and I was surprised by how beautiful he was. I'd seen movie stars that didn't have his beauty, but his leer as he took me in did nothing to make him more attractive. It was a kiss. Worst case, my lips got wet. It was a frog, after all. Ah, but everything here is not as it seems. He drawled, pushing himself up off the tree and striding towards me. 
It was a Hollywood textbook perfect stride, and I couldn't figure out how come his balls didn't catch as he swaggered in my direction. Then what is it? I asked, missing Carolian and his claws very much at the moment. You never know when a frog is really a prince in disguise. Shrugging, I resisted the urge to turn around when I heard movement behind me, though I did pull up a thin line of dirt ready to act as a shield if I needed it. I wasn't so lucky. Do you know what I'm supposed to do or go? He stood about an arm's length from me, any closer and he'd be in my personal space. As it was, he leaned closer to me and leered. It wasn't a good look on him. Give me a kiss and maybe I'll tell you. The instant nausea made no sense. Kissing a frog hadn't even made me blink, but the idea of kissing him did. Sure, I said with a bright and completely fake smile. I moved forward, grabbed his jaw with my left hand, hard, and turned his head. I dropped a quick peck on his cheek and stepped back. The entire thing had taken less than ten seconds. I felt a desire to scrub my lips again. There's your kiss. Now, which way do I head? I kept a quirk of a smile on my face as I watched him. Very amusing. Now I think I want more. He growled out the words. I suppose it was meant to sound sexy. Mostly, he sounded like he had a thorn somewhere. He moved into my space, but I snapped my arm out, palm braced on his chest, blocking him from coming in any further. No, you can tell me or not, but no. I didn't flinch as he sneered at me, just kept a calm, steady gaze, the same one I used on drunks during emergency calls. It wasn't enough. Aren't your friends worth my attentions? I don't normally have to force myself on women. He managed to sneer the words, and I fought back a shudder. They are worth everything, but I'm not touching you. My own dichotomy made no sense in my brain. I'd die for either one of them but letting this thing touch me wasn't an option. Maybe it was because I knew they would never want that. There were other ways to get the information. Who says you'll have a choice? He lunged at me, grabbing my arms and leering at me. I haven't had any satisfaction in a long time. And you'll get none today, at least from me. I hit him with a low KO, enough to shock badly, but not knock out. He yelped and ripped his hands away from me, then stepped back, glaring. How dare you? You should be willing to do anything for your friends. Apparently, you don't care about them. The entire time I'd been walking down the path to wherever I'd end up, I'd been coming up with plans. I figured at the end I'd probably had to fight a monster, maybe a flaming demon or something. So that meant I had to figure out ways to disable, even kill. I had ideas, but a simple man didn't require any of the more ruthless ones. I hoped. I do care, but why do something I find repugnant when I have other options? What do I need to do? I asked the question and steeled myself as I reached for his mind, determined to pull the thoughts out as smoothly as I could. Do? You have to fight me! He roared, springing up from the ground. I sidestepped to the other side of the small village as he charged where I had been. He had nothing in his mind but anger and desire to hurt me. He knew nothing about my quest, or if he did, he wasn't thinking about it right now. No thanks, I think I'll be leaving now. I turned and headed to the other side of town. I already knew where I'd come from, but I needed to find where I should go. What? Are you too good for our Stevie? I flinched at the name and turned to see the same woman I'd talked to at the well, glaring at me. Too high and mighty for the likes of our Stevie. I stared at her, barely remembering to keep my words civil. No, I just am not in the mood to be raped, especially by someone who has nothing to do with what I'm looking for. Now, if you'll excuse me... I'm going to go see if I can find a castle or a dragon or something. I kept walking and something pinged my shoulder. I looked down to see a rock and another clod of dirt hit me. Slut, 
Whore. Monster. Ugly wench. I turned to find the source of the cacophony of voices behind me. Standing next to their creep of a village playboy was what looked like most of the people I would have expected to see in a village like this. Men and women, mostly older than 30, wearing raw, ugly clothes, their faces lined with wrinkles and dirt. They had dirt and rocks, and maybe a vegetable or two in their hands. I had no doubt they were getting ready to throw them at me, along with the epithets. What's your problem? I don't want anything to do with him. I don't like him. I just want to find the monster I need to fight and get this over with. Selfish women. All you care about is yourselves. Too proud to spread your legs to save a friend. Or maybe you think you're above that. I wanted to scream at them. I'd do anything to save Joe and Sable. But why waste time and energy having sex when it was stupid? When he was stupid? When they were all stupid? Are you going to tell me what I need to do? Their only reply was more stones and dirt thrown at me. I dodged or ignored most of them. Fine. I offered way more than I needed to, angry and frustrated, and yanked up a wall of dirt. Their contributions hit it and made it stronger as I turned and stalked out of the village. I'd figure it out. I wasn't sure they weren't just there to delay me. But why? I didn't think I was under a time constraint. Worry scratched at the back of my mind, and I stepped up the pace, the dark path leading me out of the town with people still yelling at me. The trees grabbed my hair, pulling and tangling, and my frustration rode at the top of my mind. As I tried to move forward, it seemed like the path got narrower and narrower. Ready to change your mind? A voice I thought I'd left in the village said ahead of me on the path. I looked up from focusing on my feet. The roots would appear out of nowhere. To see him leering at me, he leaned against another tree, his manly chest on display. No, either help me or don't, but I won't have sex with you, or more accurately, let you use me. I spat the words out and resisted the temptation to just zap him, hard, but I didn't resist the temptation to try and pull more information out of him, with truth forcing. What am I supposed to do? How should I know? Well, with a friend like you, who needs enemies? He sneered at me. They'll die and you'll look back on this and regret your choice. If I keep you here long enough, I get rewarded. I just can't kill you, so why not make it fun? I can make you scream one way or the other. The words tumbled out, forced by a truth spell. My spirit sagged at the words I pulled from him, along with a feeling of guilt for affecting his free will. But his obvious enjoyment of his task tempered it. Go away. I need to get going. His aim to delay me ramped up my anxiety, and I wanted to be gone. I kept moving forward until he stepped in front of me. What if I don't want you to go? He loomed over me and my temper snapped. Then I make you. And if you really want to lay here unconscious in the woods where who knows what could come eat you, be my guest. You can't hurt me. Your little lightning strike won't stop me this time. Oh, for Merlin's sake. I groused and nailed him with a full KO. He dropped like a sack of potatoes on the path. I looked at his limp body in the dark woods surrounding us and groaned. Ugh, I can't just leave him here. Stupid morality. I offered up a bit more to Earth. It found all this amusing and asked for help. While Earth smoothed the path just enough so I wouldn't scrape his hide off on the rough path, I dragged him back to the village. Oddly, the path was much more forgiving this time, and my hair only got snagged once. The villagers, about 15 of them, stood staring at me as I dragged him in and dropped him on the ground in the middle of the road. I don't have time for this. Do you know what I need to fight? You killed him! The well woman screeched. I didn't kill him. If I had, I'd just have left him lying there for animals to eat. So, here he is. You might teach him some manners. I retorted, 
My patience about gone, and the fear that there was a clock counting down creating even more stress. You'll never rescue them. You aren't worthy. She spat out the words, then literally spat at me. It hit my face and slid down. Ew! Do you know how filthy human saliva is? I wiped it off with my sleeve and debated digging in my pack for the alcohol wipes, but I figured that would take too much time. What is wrong with you people? Just leave me alone. I'll figure it out myself. Witch. Monster. They started screaming more things at me, and the rocks and dirt clods accelerated. Enough! I screamed and let loose a widespread KO, thinking yellow as I did it. A full two inches of the braid with a yellow band vaporized, and they all collapsed to the ground. I rubbed my temples, beyond exasperated and verging on angry. What is with people? Are people in the realms just not normal? Ugh, I have to get the monster. The trees better let me through, or this time there might be some fire making my way. With a final huff and a quick double check that no one had seriously hurt themselves crumpling to the ground, I trudged back to the forest path. Interestingly, the branches seemed to leave me alone, which was good as I was fully ready to offer up a lot more hair if it got grabby again. The path seemed wide, and while not welcoming, it didn't have the claustrophobic closeness it had previously. Realm geography, I swear. I muttered as I headed down the path. After what felt like forever walking, up ahead, I saw a cave looming off to one side of the road. Yes, monster, I can do this. My frustration had faded, and now I was worried again about facing a monster. It doesn't matter. I got this. I straightened up, brought my various spells to the forefront, and headed towards the shadowy entrance. I cast Lady Luck on myself. I had Break, KO, Murphy, Open, Shake, and Volcano ready. Using Volcano wasn't anything I wanted to do. I never used it before, but I would if I faced something I didn't think I could just subdue. The word monster disturbed me more and more as I met creatures from other realms. Baneral would be a monster. Tersane? Definitely. She still freaked me out, but I didn't think I could call her a monster. Not anymore. So what was a monster? Frankly, the people back there had struck me as more monstrous than any of the creatures I had met yet. Granted, none of them have tried to kill me yet. That might change my mind. Taking one more moment to tighten the straps on my pack, I stepped into the cave with slow, careful steps as I moved in. Ahead was a bit of light, and as I didn't see any other passages, I walked towards it. At the last step, I caught my foot on something and tumbled into the light. Chapter 33 The mage laws are in place for a reason. We have the 28th Amendment to make sure mages never get in control of the country, but unless they are enforced strictly, you risk a mage becoming a villain from horror stories. Evil, ruthless, unstoppable. Use the laws, weed them out, and make sure those who remain are on the right side for freedom of this country, even at the cost of themselves. Draft Board Internal Memo I scrambled to my feet, expecting an attack any second. I saw Carolian sitting there looking at me, his head tilted to one side. I turned to see the bean, arms crossed, and it felt like it glared at me. What? Where's the monster? I can go back. I can defeat it. I just couldn't find it. I protested, turning, ready to sprint back into the portal. But the area behind the stature of the man was empty. Only grass and trees where I had entered. Please, I'll try again. I would have begged if I thought it would do any good. I saw Carolian's tail start to lash back and forth, but I couldn't take the time to focus on him. I had to defeat Wrath. I don't know if I like you or really dislike you. You never act the way the others have. The tone was petulant and it floated over to me. 
Do you know what he did in that situation? Its arms lifted up to point at the statue of the male. My shoulders slumped. Did he defeat it? I didn't know anything anymore. Was he wrath? Should I have met up with him? How long had I been here or there? I felt dizzy and so tired that crying seemed like a good idea. That made no sense. Why should I be so tired? He skinned the seducer alive, though in his test, it was a woman. Then he rounded up all the townsfolk and showed them exactly why he was feared. When they didn't give him the answers he wanted, taunting him with his failures to perform, he burned them and the entire town alive. It threw both hands up in the air, the gesture so evocative of its frustration I almost laughed. Wait, the town was the test? I blinked at it, then felt like a complete idiot. Yes, and you were nice, took care of them, even when they tried to hurt you. You just put them to sleep. You even pulled the man to a safe place. Are you sure you're a mage? You don't act like one. Relief made me giddy, and I went over to Carlion and dropped down next to him. I put my head on his shoulder. His deep purr helped calm my emotions. I dug food out of my pack and ate. My stomach informed me it was happy with this addition. I wondered how bad my time sense was here. Had hours or days passed in my world? Fine. You defeated Wrath. Or more accurately, you did not give in to it. Are you ready to face the next one? Avarice? I shrugged. If they are all the same, it would be easy to avoid. This one caught me because I wasn't ready for it. But I'm not greedy or anything. At least I didn't think I was. They are never the same. Wrath is the only one that follows the same lines. But they are your trials, not mine. Pick your next trial. It waved at the two remaining portals, the women standing like guardians and warnings of what my fate might be. I shoved more food in my face, chewing hurriedly before swallowing. You owe me the answer to three questions first. That was partly because I wanted to know, and partly because I wanted a chance to eat some more. It huffed at me, then floated over. Very well. Ask. Who are you? It rotated in a circle, the tips of its feet barely touching the ground. You still do not know? I would have thought Wells would have told you. I never met him. He died before I ever knew he existed, or that I was a mage, or anything, really. Ah, as you will either become an immortal statue or my owner, I do not see any risk in revealing myself. It spun faster and faster, the gray peeling away like strips of tissue to reveal a feminine figure. It was shorter than me, maybe 5'3", with arms and legs too long and lanky to ever be human. Though nut brown, her skin looked hard and scratchy. Her head was elongated, and a sharp chin and nose created a profile that reminded me of an almond. Instead of hair, she had leaves that twisted and waved in the breeze. Wow, I murmured, having no idea what stood before me. Is that all you can say, human? Wells was the one who saved me, trapped me, geshed me, and all you can murmur is a word. Well, I know you look wonderful, I said slowly. Flattery was always a better option than anything else. But I still don't know who you are. I bit back all the questions I wanted to ask. I only had two left, and I didn't want to waste them on something stupid. Are all humans this stupid? Her voice full of exasperation again. At this point, if her challenge was to not lose her patience with the mortal, she'd lose. Careful. My queen has never seen your kind, and even I have only seen one your type once. Carolyn's warning rang clear in my mind, 
and I focused on putting food away. Eating it all now would be stupid and risky. Ah, I forget how blindfolded and sheltered humans are. I am a dryad. My name is Hamadia. She said with a bow. You should be honored. Oh, I am. I just don't understand how a mage, even a merlin, could bind and gash a dryad. I crossed my fingers in Kaelian's fur. Is that your second question? It asked instead. I sighed. My trick hadn't worked. Oh well. No. My second question is, what does being magic's herald mean? Hamadia shook her head. I cannot answer that. It is up to magic what she asks of her herald. Ask again. I chewed on my lip, then asked the question that mattered the most. If I fail, what happens to Joe, Sable, and Carolyn? Hamadia turned to me, brows creased. Happens to your focus? That is up to him. He may stay, though I cannot see a creature of chaos happy here, or go home, or to Earth. That is his call. As for my bait? She shrugged. They will be given to chaos or spirit or even order to be used and devoured as wished. She gave me another hard look, then her eyes widened. There are prices to failure, and I would not want to be them should you fail. Her smile proved there was nothing human about her. Magic is dangerous, as are all its creatures. Last question. The calmness in her as she said she could give Joe and Sable to chaos made me want to scream. I remembered the last screams from Paul Goins as chaos took him. To do that to people I loved? Never. I struggled to get my emotions under control. Once I managed to stop myself from trying to kill her, I pondered what to ask. I had to get ready for my next test and not let worry about Joe and Sable ensure I'd lose them. Why are you the house? It came out a bit plaintive, and I suspected I'd wasted a question, but right this moment, my mind was in a whirl of other worries. Did you not notice something odd in the basement? Hamiata countered, looking smug. No, I replied. Yes, Carolyn said in contradiction. I glared at the back of his head. Why didn't you tell me you noticed something weird? What was weird? All human residences are weird. Not bad weird. And I had no way of knowing what was bad weird versus good weird. He said, his tail slapping me on the back of the head. I sighed and looked at the dryad. (sighs) Weird doesn't tell me much. It is a long story. Maybe if you live, doubtful that. I will share it. But Wells rescued me long ago and my sapling grew into the house. My branches are in the walls. My roots protect the pipes. My leaves are the shingles on the roof. I am in a very real sense, the house. I live in a treehouse. Neat, I guess. Do we need to do anything to take care of you? I asked, even as I had horrid images of trying to change something in the house and cutting into a branch or root. Take care of me? Her voice sounded odd, stilted almost. Well, I figured you're getting sun and water, but do you need fertilizer or... I fumbled. I knew nothing about plants. I don't know. Anything else? I mean, you're part of the house, so what else do I need to do to keep you healthy, too? She just looked at me. When I had started to shift, uncomfortable at the unwavering stare, dryads were worse than cats. She moved. This will be thought about. Now, on to the next challenge. Then I remembered the next thing I was supposed to ask. How much time was passing? I growled at myself. Why did I never remember things when I needed to? I shook my head and stood up. I'm ready. You need to go and get this gem. She held out her hand and an image appeared there. 
a large octagonal faceted gem, reflecting red with hints of blue and purple, sat in her hand. Get this, and only this, and bring it back to me. I stared at the gem, and the image of Aladdin's cave, filled with precious gems, pearls, carpets, and vases, appeared in my mind. Just bring you that, and I pass? Yes, you may not bring out anything else at all. Hamiata's voice was firm. She dropped her hand, and the image disappeared. I almost sagged in relief. This I could do. I had no desire for gold or gems, and while a flying carpet might be nice, definitely not worth Joe and Sable's lives. Not a problem. I turned to look at Carolian, who had stilled, his ears canted back. Watch over them. I'll be back quickly. I headed to the portal, laying it out in my mind. Find the path, head up it, grab the stone. It looked small enough to slip into a pocket in my pants, and then get back here. Wait, can I get through more questions when I get back? Himadia tilted her head, only the tips of her toes touching the grass. It made her look like she floated. Even the green clothes that hung on her seemed perfect and even. She fit here, and my disheveled existence seemed to annoy her. Why? You will fail. Caught by the treasures there. She said airily. I opened my mouth, caught sight of the other statue, and snapped it closed. I reconsidered what I was going to say. I think that Joe and Sable are important enough to me to make sure I pass. Hmm. If you survive, I will give you two. Only because I do not believe you will. And if you do the last one, well, if you pass that one, then you will own me, and I will answer any question I can. I get you as a servant? That seemed way too much like slavery. That is a question. Survive the challenge, and you may ask it if you like. Her smugness bugged me, but I just nodded. If anything, being here made me watch my temper very closely. What had the others risked? Or had they done the challenges for the reward? I didn't think they had been vying for the house. What had their reward been? The more I thought, the more questions I had. Better questions than what I had asked. Someday, I'm going to act and think like a real adult, not like a stupid kid. I huffed at myself and spun back to the portal. It swirled in golds, greens, reds, and silvers. It was beautiful, and rather intimidating. Compared to the dark opening of the other, this one both attracted and repelled me. Get the gem, Corey. You got this. I repeated that over and over through my mind as I stepped into the portal. Chapter 34 There have been three investigations into the deaths of people in the draft. However, all cases have been proven to both the draft board and the OMO investigator to be either reckless endangerment or training accidents. House of Emrys Report I stumbled a bit, stepping through and paused to get my balance. When my eyes adjusted to the low light, a shriek forced its way past my frozen lips. I swallowed as I looked at the cliff that dropped away to nothing, not one step from me. I didn't have any problem with heights as a general rule, but to find myself on the edge of a cliff where I couldn't even see the bottom, well, that was worth a scream. It took me a minute to get my trembling under control before turning to look both ways. To my left, about 15 feet away, was a rickety rope and wood bridge. With one last glance at the edge of the cliff, I carefully made my way to it, casting Lady Luck as I did so. I was going to need all the help I could get. The bridge looked in one piece, but it also looked hand-tied and old. Old, dirty ropes as thick as my wrist ran the length of the gap. Each piece of wood looked like it had been hacked out of a table by a toddler with a butter knife. And the posts? Well, they were nice solid stone, old and weathered, cracked, and the home for more species of lichen than I could count. I checked again, but as far as I could see, this was the only way across. 
I triple secured my backpack, making sure even the chest straps were locked and cinched tight. With a deep breath, I gave the rope a good yank. Nothing happened. No fraying or ominous creaking or even cracks of wood. Joe and Sable. I held that in my mind as a mantra. My foot touched the first rung, and with one hand tightly wrapped on either side, I shifted my weight. There was a long groan, and I tensed, ready to throw myself back onto land. But nothing else happened. Step by step, my hands aching from how tightly I held the scratchy rope, I crossed the bridge. Time slowed to step, wait, step, never letting more than one hand off the side at a time. Three more steps and the end of the bridge taunted me. I forced myself to continue my slow, measured steps, but I wanted to run, to sprint so badly. One more step. My foot touched the ground, and there was a tremendous creaking and shuddering behind me. My heart jammed itself in my throat as I threw myself to the ground and rolled away. After two rolls across the dusty ground, I sat up and looked back, expecting to see the bridge in pieces. My only way back lost. Are you kidding me? I shouted. Where the bridge had hung, rickety, dangerous, and something out of a Merlin-blasted Wisconsin Jones magical relic hunter movie, now a gleaming marble bridge, solid and massive enough to support a tank, spanned the chasm. I could all but feel magic laughing at me, as I figured it would have if the bridge gave, and I plummeted to my death. With my eyes closed, I tried to get control of my racing heart. Near-death experiences were not anything I enjoyed. Once my heart slowed, I pushed myself to my feet and took in my side of the try-to-kill Cory chasm. A huge building, gray stone pillars, hulking gargoyles, and the stereotypical temple of doom awaited me. Frowning, I looked back at the other side of the thin ledge. I should have been able to see the portal from there, but I couldn't. Ugh, magic. Magical realm. Exasperation was becoming my default state. Taking a deep breath, I headed into the building. It looked like a cross between a library and a temple. Stepping in, all my previous preconceptions were dashed to the ground. There was no piles of jewels or mounds of gold or even rolls of carpets, and definitely no talking genie. It was worse. I swallowed as I moved into the building, where my imagination had chaotic piles of things, treasures to sift through, and hidden objects at every turn. This was like a museum. Collections of jewels laid out on black velvet sparkled at me. Vases and lamps, clearly labeled with their origin and value, sat on pedestals, glowing with beauty. Okay, order, got it. I swallowed and kept walking. It reminded me of a Scandinavian furniture store in that the path led me through and around with new treasures at every turn. Laid out and presented in ways that called to you, made you want to see them, see how they would look on you. Convenient mirrors sat next to the necklaces and tiaras, and three-way mirrors next to dresses that called to be fondled and tried on. I don't need any of this. I repeated and kept walking. The jewels and jewelry petered out as the clothes became more exotic and stunning, though some of them I'd never go anywhere they would be appropriate. So other than the desire to play dress up, I kept walking. An arch appeared, and I moved through into a second gallery that reminded me of a library, like the National Archives. The books, documents, and pictures were laid out along the path close enough to touch, and so close, I couldn't help but read the placards declaring their identity. True History of Atlantis by Mara Magic Explained by Morgana Le Fay That book was at least eight inches thick. All Known Causes of Death by Death I stopped in my tracks. That couldn't be what it meant. It had to be a joke. I shook my head and kept walking, but I couldn't stop myself from reading the placards. Deaths and Their Causes by Death It was open, 
and the day my brother died was written at the top of the page. I froze in my tracks. Could this be real? Could I find out how my brother died? I swallowed hard. It would be so easy to lean over, read the book, get the answer. I wouldn't take it. The book could stay. But I would take out the knowledge. I stood there, just far enough I couldn't make out the words. Get the gem and leave. I forced myself to turn and continue walking. The next placard all but grabbed my eyes. How to Cure Anything and Anyone by Asclepius. My mouth went dry. With that, I could save people. They would never have to die again. Surely knowledge wouldn't be taking something. I could figure out how I could have prevented Stevie from dying. No one else would ever have to suffer. Bobby, the boy in the car, the one who I touched as he died. I could have saved him. My hand reached out towards the book. I could just read a few pages. Maybe find out how to cure cancer. All the people that alone could save. I yanked my hand back. I'll ask. If she says yes, I can come back and read. I'll ask. I rushed down the path, trying so hard not to see, but still things jumped out at me. A mirror of communication. Talk to anyone, anywhere. A bracelet of unification. Heal divisions between people. A necklace of languages. Understand and speak every language. I wanted so much. I could do so much with these things. I can make so many people's lives better. I could help people. My vision grew blurry, and I realized I was crying as I walked. So many things here that could change so many people's lives, save children. Were Joe and Sable more important than all the lives I could save? Would they forgive me if they knew what I gave up to save them? The world fuzzed around me as I stopped, weighing the consequences. I would get what I took but they would die. I started to pivot. I wouldn't get the book on death, but on curing. I could cure anyone, maybe even... I jerked to a halt, remembering what Hamadia had said. They were told they would not be Magic's herald if they failed, but they would get what they took. It had been a lie. Everything had been a lie. If I took anything from here, I would fail and Joe and Sable would die horribly. I wanted to scream, to rage. Instead, I forged ahead, the path suddenly short. It seemed only a minute before I stopped in front of a pedestal, with the red gem sitting there, looking dowdy compared to other things I had seen. As if to reinforce my goal, it too had a placard. Return to Himadia. I picked it up and dropped it in my pocket then spun, anger driving my steps, and headed out of the Hall of Temptation. As I rushed back through, the displays seemed brighter, catchier. They called me to look, to explore. The image of the statues remained focused in my mind. If I stole from here, not only would Joe and Sable die, but I would be a statue, unable to do anything with the knowledge. What if she lied? I slowed. What if she lied about the consequences? I had no idea when those people turned into statues. Heck, I didn't know if anything she told me was true. She might kill Joe and Sable even if I passed the test. The books about death and curing lay ahead, bright and seductive. I never wanted anything as much as I wanted them. I'd even give up the house if I could have that knowledge. The lives I could save the lives it might cost. I stood between the books, close enough I could almost read the words. The Cure Anything book had opened, and in bold type on the page, types of cancer was easily readable. The other still lay open to the day my brother died. A quick look wouldn't hurt, just to know, once and for all, is that knowledge worth their lives? The answer was a resounding no. But then the book of cures lay there. How to cure cancer. I'd be willing to die for that. But my mind locked on the ethical ramifications. What was the difference between choosing to let Joe die 
and killing her myself. It was one thing if she was here and said yes, but to take that choice away? To take her life because I thought I knew better, that I knew the value of her life. Something deep in me recoiled in horror at that thought. That would make me no better than the killer Kelly, killing for art. Was I willing to kill for knowledge? Never. I turned and strode out. The temptation withered and tarnished. When I reached the chasm, I stopped and looked at the bridge. It was stone and solid. I narrowed my eyes and strode out onto it. Three steps in, it shivered and began to change. No, I am tired of being scared. Magic wants me? Well, she's going to get a Merlin-blasted dragon. I stood rock steady as the bridge shifted, but rather than the rickety rope and wood that I expected, it became a wondrous thing of gold and silver. Filigree work graced the railings, the arch constructed of fleur de lises and swirls, the base a solid shining metal that led in a graceful swoop to the land on the other side. Is this your way of saying I passed? I asked, looking around. I still couldn't see much more than a cliff and a temple, but it felt warmer and less oppressive than it had. There wasn't any answer that I noticed, and I walked across the bridge as if it was as steady as one human built, no matter how much I expected it to crumble underneath me. My wariness remained until I stepped back through the portal into the glade. Chapter 35 the monsters that were reportedly at the set game in Atlanta should be of great concern to humans. They are examples of what happens when magic runs amok. Do you want your child changing into a snake creature or being eaten by a blob? For the sake of all humanity, we need to walk away from magic now before it is too late. Freedom from Magic You passed. I... Himadia broke off, staring at me. I did not expect you to succeed. I placed the stone in her hand and walked over to look at Joe and Sable hanging in the air. If they were aware and with me, I'd be talking this over with them. As it was, I still had one more trial to pass. The last one had been closer than I liked. Did you lie? The question slipped out and I snarled. That wasn't what I wanted to waste one of my questions on. That is a broad question. About what? She looked curious, not smug, and I didn't know if that was better or not. About me getting to keep what I found. The knowledge. Them turning to statues because they failed. All of it. Oh, that. She smiled a tiny bit, but it was sad almost. I will answer that question after the final trial, so that question does not count. What else did you want to ask? I clenched my fists and turned to look at my friends. Caroline came over and rubbed against me, the heat from his body sinking into my leg. Letting myself pet him, I tried to calm down and focus on the question I needed to ask. Time. How much of it is passing here? Himadia furrowed her brows together. As much time as it takes. No, I mean, if I spend an hour here, how much time is passing on Earth, in my realm? This is not the Underhill domain, simply a pocket next to your house. Time flows double there, I think. She smiled as she said that, revealing round green teeth, reminding me she was not even remotely human. I pulled my eyes away from her teeth and glanced at my watch. I'd been here about six hours, which meant twelve hours had passed. By the time I got back, I'd probably have people banging on my door, demanding my surrender. Good thing I didn't grab that info. Probably wouldn't be free long enough to use it. I pushed all that away. Nothing matter now but getting Sable and Joe home. Is there not more? Himadia's voice pulled me out of my own thoughts, and I frowned at her inquisitive look. Oh, yeah, I get one more question. 
My brain felt like a wet fog had fallen on it, and I struggled to push everything away and focus. Corey? Carolyn asked, his tone worried. I didn't respond, but scratched his ears. The need for caffeine clammed into me as I sat, pulling out one of the mini Cokes I'd stashed in my pack. It was a bit dented, but the can opened. I spent a tiny fraction of offering to cool it down. More than worth it. Warm Cokes sucked. The icy cold carbonation poured down my throat, washing away some of the film from my throat and my spirit. I took a deep breath and let the air from the glade flow down my throat and forced my shoulders to relax. I could do this. I needed to do it. Second question. Does Celestra know you're doing this? I was mostly curious to see how autonomous her actions were. If it was her and magic, or if there was something or someone else involved. I touched my necklace, but the idea of bringing Tursane into this scared me more than almost anything. A huge smile crossed her face, and she leaned closer to me, her teeth bright green beads. Who do you think has been helping with all of this? I suddenly needed to pee. I was so scared my body contracted every muscle. My throat wouldn't work, my lungs wouldn't inhale. Oh, Merlin, I'm going to die. See, powerful queen, murmured Carolyn. That shocked me into movement as I whipped my head to stare at him, the braids lashing at my face. Are, are you insane? I sputtered at him. I don't need the gods of the realms taking any interest in my life. Himadia snorted. <laughs> they are not gods, not exactly, and I do not think I am insane. But then, by your definitions, maybe I am. Are you ready for the final test? She watched me with unblinking green eyes. I didn't bother to correct her assumption I'd been talking to her. The rush of fear-driven adrenaline cleared up any remaining exhaustion or mental fog. Yes, let's get it over with. I shall watch this with great curiosity. I sighed as I carefully drained the Coke can and put it away. What is the trial? Survive and do what you think is the best thing to do until the portal reappears. That's it? Just survive? Not get something or defeat something? Do you really wish it to be more difficult? Madia didn't quite laugh at me, but I could sense it. No, just checking. I want to make sure I get this done. Get my friends out of here. I gazed at the pillars of light. At least they didn't have to be aware, wondering if they would live or die. Then you had better succeed, hadn't you? She waved at the remaining portal. I gave her a look I hoped was confident. Yes, I will. I headed towards the portal, this one an opaque silver gray that told me nothing, but it had an odd elegance I rather enjoyed. Once more into the breach. I whispered and stepped through. This time it felt like walking through a fog rather than pulling ice through a membrane. I don't know how long I walked. My watch had gone wonky, and I just put one foot in front of the other. Boredom set in as I walked, but I didn't dare stop. My eyes fought to stay open as I plodded through the gray tunnel. One step after another, I covered my mouth as I yawned. If this was the trial, I might fail because I'd fall asleep with this slow, nonstop walking. Trying to keep focused wasn't happening. My mind drifted to items in that place of temptation, and a pang of what might have been slashed through me. It grew stronger and hotter, and my eyes flew open. I shrieked as flames washed over me. I made a desperate offering, giving away more than I ever would have normally to fire, asking it to not burn me. The heat seared across my skin, then vanished as fire accepted with a laugh. I panted for a moment as I tried to figure out where I was. Flames washed around me, flicking across my skin and clothes, but not burning. The hot air rushing into my lungs didn't help me to calm down as I turned, frantic to find a way out. There to the left, the flames were thinner, and I thought I saw blue sky. With a gasp of relief, I jogged that direction. The fire faded, and I stepped out onto a wide stone plaza. 
The cool air eased my lungs and skin as I gazed out at what stared back at me. It was a triangle plaza with walls at least 15 feet high. From where I stood at one tip, it was at least 50 yards to the opposing wall. There was a large round raised section in the middle. Large gates stood in the walls from my tip, leading to elsewhere. But what made me stand there like a deer with an oncoming semi was everything else. The other two points of the triangle were stadium seatings for at least a thousand, and they were packed with beans. Not humans. Beans. I saw feathers, scales, beaks, wings, hide, skin, hair, talons, claws, and more things than I could put names to. I didn't even have names for all the beans I saw. And they all stared at me. I glanced behind me, just on the off hope that maybe there was something behind me. What I saw didn't help my panic levels at all. Where the other two points of the triangle had banners hanging from them, I had an archway of flames leading to where I'd come from. Why me? I rotated back to look at everyone looking at me. What by Merlin's balls do I do? My feet felt like they'd been encased in mud, and I didn't know where to go. Even the flames were starting to seem attractive. Movement at the raised dais grabbed my attention. It looked round or oblong, and had another stone structure on top of it that went up about three or four feet. But what caught my attention was the movement. On either side of the raised stone structure were two statues, one of a hippogriff and one of a Cerberus. I knew it was a hippogriff because instead of lion-like front paws, it had eagle-like legs and claws. It was a beautiful gold and cream color, the only breaks in the color scheme being the black talons and the bright yellow beak, which is why I had assumed it was a statue. Are you the challenger from magic here to test our worthiness and our offerings? The voice rang in my head, deep and mellow, like a brass bell in a monastery. Huh? Was my super intelligent answer. I coughed to clear out the phlegm caused by the heat of the fire and my own panic. <clears throat> I'm sorry, what? You entered via the realm's gate. Therefore, you were sent by magic. Is that not true? There was a warning tone in his voice, and my heart rate, which had just started to level out, sped back up. Don't lie. Never lie. Tell the truth. I was sent here for a trial. Magic is involved in why I am here. That was the truth. It just ignored all the complications of my life. But that made me look around. How was this a test of my arrogance? Which I still didn't think I was. Before I had time to focus too much on that, another voice spoke. Then we shall assume magic sent you. We are the guardians of the offerings. We shall defeat you to prove our offerings are worthy of magic. Huh? What did that mean? I must have looked like an idiot blinking at them, but that vanished as the hippogriff threw a spear at me. Reflexively, I dove to one side, pulling Lady Luck to me. I rolled just in time to miss the attack from the Cerberus. Three jaws snapped at me as the hippogriff charged me. Merlin! I yelled and grabbed earth and begged. A bit of braid vaporized as stone burst upward, blocking the Cerberus, and I scrambled to my feet. My mind scattered and I fell back on my reliable spells. I reached and pulled the spirit from the hippogriff, then let it snap back in. A screech of pain and shock cut through the roars of the crowd, then it echoed back even louder. The crowd filled the arena with their stomping and clacking, my heart beat with the rhythm they set. Hot breath on my neck had me dropping and rolling. I really needed to get some martial arts training at this rate. Teeth snapped as I fell, close enough that saliva splattered me. What is it with you people and saliva? Ew! I readied a KO and reached out to touch the Cerberus, but it jumped back, barking. The bark slammed into me with the force of a sonic wave, and I snarled. A matching screech came from above as a shadow flickered above me. One of the spells I'd only read about came to mind, and with a fast offering to entropy, I cast Disrupt straight up. 
It wasn't a KO spell and that it would knock someone out, but it had correlations. Disrupt jumbled the target's thoughts, and they lost track of their focus. As I sent it up, I spied a heavy chain around the dog's neck and grinned. With another offering to both Earth and the oddness of non-organic, I increased the magnetic attraction between his collar and the metal in the Earth. Groaning, he fell to the ground, neck laying stretched out where the collar held him down. I stood and looked around. The hippogriff lay shaking its head, trying to remember what had been going on, while the Cerberus panted, unable to move. I had ripped up stonework and managed to tear my shirt at the elbow, raw bleeding flesh stinging at my awareness. The stadium fell silent as I stood there, shaking with adrenaline and rage. Pax, we are defeated. Magic's herald is mighty indeed. Do you deem us worthy of the offerings? The voice, the hippogriffs, I thought, rang in my mind. Sure, you're worthy. I had no idea what I was talking about and just wanted this over with. Then release us, herald, and we shall finish the offering. With a wary swallow, I canceled the magic holding the dog down. The disrupt had been fading anyhow. They both rose to the cheers of the beans watching. This entire thing made no sense, but I tried to roll with it. They walked towards me. I tensed, ready to sidestep or something, but they bowed to me, which was almost worse than attacking me. Follow us, Harold, and we will complete the offering. They turned and walked to the dais, bounding up. I followed a bit slower and had to heave myself up. It was almost two feet high. They stood next to the raised cylinder, and the hippogriff had one foreclaw high in the air, above raised section. We have witnessed the acceptance from Magic's Herald. Now we offer up those that are ours to the will of Magic. By blood and spirit, we renew our fealty to which we are. I moved over to the raised area and looked down. Rage and horror flooded through me. By Merlin's magic, what is wrong with you? I screamed and pulled on earth, offering my own blood as the talons swept down. Chapter 36 House of Emrys is looking for some mages interested in investigating the deaths of 70% of the BAM, badass mages, gang a few weeks ago. Contact Scott Randolph for information. There is a reward for any conclusive evidence as to the cause of the deaths. Security protocols enacted. House of Emrys job notice. Earth flowed up and the wickedly sharp talons bounced off of it. The two I had just fought spun and glared at me. This time I could feel their rage. I didn't care. My rage burned just as hot. My hand waved to the dome I had created to protect the three creatures laying there. In the few seconds I had to look, their existence had seared into my mind with clarity that only terror brings. Something I knew too well. I could still remember every inch of the Emperor of Japan's inner chambers when I dragged his assassin there. You were going to offer these babies to magic? I demanded as I let the dome crumble and stared at the three infant creatures. Though I never had much of a maternal instinct, it was all I could do to not reach down and sweep them up in my arms, except that I couldn't carry three of them. One was a cath kit, its fur a chocolate brown, with amber eyes and white tufts on its ears. It looked up at me, mewing, the bowl too deep and smooth for it to climb out. Another looked like a baby gorgon, it even had its shell with it, coiled and hissing as the baby snakes on its head twisted and lunged at nothing. Even with the dark black scales on its lower body and a human baby face except for the slitted eyes, it still managed to look cute. The third was a Chitarian, like Charles Arachina. Chitarians were creatures with too many legs. The tiny baby crouched in a cage green and gray colors flashing as its legs moved up and down as if typing. How could you do this? I demanded, 
wanting to cry. You are interfering, Harold. Step back and allow the ritual to continue. The Cerberus bellowed, hot breath and spittle flying at me. I snarled back, never. If I stood by and allowed these children to come to harm, it would be the same as sacrificing Joe, believing it was what she wanted. I pulled a dome over the kids again and tried to think of what to do. But in the few seconds that took, the stands had emptied of beans and they were all charging me. While reading emotions on beans that were not human was not my forte, it didn't take any stretch of the imagination to decide they were extremely unhappy with me. Crap. I panicked, trying to balance out protecting the kids and staying alive. I scrambled up on top of what I now realized was an altar, and wasn't that creepy, and created a time bubble. The altar and I with the kids jumped five minutes ahead in the timeline, Five minutes seemed to be my default if I didn't have time to concentrate. Crap, crap, crap. I'll get you out of here. Promise. I muttered as I spun trying to think. To my horror and astonishment, the hippogriff snarled and blurred. Then he was in the time bubble with me. Ack! I croaked and fell off the raised altar. The bubble stretched, but not enough. Desperate, I pushed it out so it encompassed the raised dais but that pulled in three other creatures. A calf with a midnight black coat, ears laid back, hissing at me. A centaur, and what looked like a larger version of Elzeba, the flying snake. Oh shit, I muttered as I hit them with a disrupt. Maybe if I did that, I could get them with a KO. I had never practiced wide casts like what I'd seen at the fairgrounds, another thing to remember to do at a later point. If I survived... It hit the snake thing, but the calf, centaur, and hippogriff knocked it aside. Worse, I felt something coming at me. I pulled the dust from the dome into a shield around me, so the magic hit it instead of me, dispersing to my relief. Before I could come up with another attack, the ground under my feet began to tremble. I offered a huge amount, feeling another chunk of braid vanish as I begged the earth to not do whatever was being asked. It became a clash of wills between the centaur and me. I had no idea how I knew it was him, but I did. The snake rose back up, hissing in obvious fury and shooting a stream of liquid from its mouth. My dust shield stopped it, but the material started to dissolve. A spear flew towards my throat, squeaking, I sidestepped out of the time bubble, figuring they needed the ritual to hurt the kids, and right now, everyone was very focused on me. I collapsed to my knees as time slammed into me. Note to self, don't sidestep out of a time bubble. I shook myself and pushed to my feet. The mass of furious beings had shifted, turning to face me. Nothing in my life had ever prepared me for the amount of fear that pumped through me. I was looking at my death, and I knew it. I could see fireballs being readied, whirlwinds spinning up, teeth and claws bared, all with the intent of killing me. The sound, if I lived long enough, that sound would haunt me forever. Claws on stone, the rustle of wings, the growl from too many throats. I never realized that leather versus scaled versus feather wings all sounded different. I knew now. I also knew what rage smelled like. The odor mugged my senses, so thick it felt like a coating of musk, smoke, and regret. If I'd had anywhere to flee, I might have. If I could have taken the kids with me. I clenched my hands. So be it. But I would go down fighting. I wouldn't let anyone murder kids. Being attacked by hordes of realm beings is an excellent motivator to extend your abilities. I knew the theory of wave KO. I'd seen it done. I now had about three seconds to figure out how to cast it. Screw it, I muttered, and offered a solid inch from the bottom of my hairline, mixed with the blood from the abrasions on my arm, and I thrust. There was an odd reluctance, but it was accepted and I threw out the KO. To my joy and horror, half of them dropped unconscious, 
as I disrupted the electrical impulses to their brains. The rest kept coming, and that was more than enough to kill me. I'm sorry, Joe. I grabbed Earth and pulled, shooting me straight up and almost knocking me off balance. That barely slowed the mob as half of them began to fly or climb straight towards me. Plus, the lovely fact that I'd gone up high enough that falling would result in significant injuries. I didn't know what else to do. I'm going to fail everything, and those kids are still going to die. Halt! A voice like a crystal knife cut through the plaza and my brain. I sagged as a spike of pain made me go blind for a moment. Teetering on the top of my earth spike, I looked down at the ruin of the plaza, feeling a flash of guilt for the amount of damage. It took me a minute to register all the beings bowing and backing away from me. I turned and found myself facing a huge unicorn. A unicorn that was snarling up at me, revealing a great many sharp fangs. Cory Munro, get down here. Every word shards of obsidian glass cutting through my mind. I wanted to weep from the pain it hurt so much, but the rage embedded in every syllable didn't allow any disobedience. My shoulders slumped as I asked Earth to lower me down. It did with alacrity, and I got the unsettling impression Solistra scared it as much as me. As I lowered down, the assembled crowd stepped back, and formed a gauntlet for me to walk down. Their hot, angry breaths seared across my face as I plodded down the path that was much, much too short. Celestra stood there, beautiful and deadly, her head slightly turned as she kept an eye on me. Her hoof tapped the ground, sending up sparks, and I swallowed. Be a blasted dragon. If you're about to get eaten, be a dragon about it. For Merlin's sake. I stood up straighter and marched up to her. Yes. She faced me directly, lids narrowed over eyes with too much depth in them. Why are you interfering with our ritual? She demanded, and I fought not to flinch at each word. I channeled my anger and fear and snarled back. Why are you offering children? How could you? What else would we offer? The entire process is giving magic what we find most precious. There is nothing more precious than our children. I couldn't suppress the gasp of pain as her words sliced into my brain. A trickle of liquid ran from my nose. And you call us barbarians. We don't offer up children. I was shouting back at her. Around us, the assembled beings watched. So quiet, it felt like I stood inside a crypt with the dead watching me. She spat at me, but this time I ignored the saliva hitting me as I bared my teeth. I won't stand by idly while you kill children. Humans! I hadn't realized it was possible to turn the words into a cuss word. And you wonder why I break my toys. So arrogant, thinking they know what is best that they can set the morals for everyone else, and Americans are the worst. The words hit me like a kidney punch, hard and fast, and all my bravado collapsed. Arrogant? I whispered, and I turned to look at the altar. Yes, she hissed. You come into our world and tell us how to live. This is why it is easier to kill you than deal with your kind. Why Tersane favors you, I will never know. I looked around at the beans, the people staring at me. Me, who had just shattered their religious ceremony because I thought I was doing the right thing. By my morals. Each thought hammered into my heart as I closed my eyes. I had been arrogant. I had expected magic, or knowledge, or medicine— but this was arrogance about being human, about thinking human ways were better than theirs, about counting their wants as less. I looked at the unicorn, thinking how quickly those teeth could shred me and how much I had just earned it. 
I felt like a ball of snot that needed to be flicked off a finger but wouldn't fall off. I apologize. I slowly knelt and bowed my head to Salistra. I was, I am, a fool, and I... I swallowed as I forced myself to say the bitter words. I assumed my culture and morals were more important than yours. How may I make up for my... I paused, glancing to either side, cringing at the damage I'd done to their plaza, or holy place, or whatever it was. Actions. A wave of low sounds rippled out through the crowd, a mix of clacks and rustles, slithers and growls. I stayed where I was, head bowed, and thanked everything I could think of that I hadn't killed anyone. The shuffling silence continued, and I swore I could feel Salistra's breath on my exposed nape, but I remained on my knees. If I died, at least Joe and Sable would be okay. Carolee might never forgive me, though. I begin to see. Stand, mortal. I want to see your face. I winced at each word but stood, feeling disheveled and off balance. I shifted my backpack. Merlin only knew how much had been broken in there with my rolling around on it. Luckily, I'd used mostly baggies and soft packaging for the food and water. The weight of gazes from all the beans made me want to crumble in a ball. But I channeled what remained of my inner dragon and accepted it. I met her gaze and waited for judgment. You are going to repair every inch of this plaza, and you will witness the offering. If you manage to do both of those with a modicum of integrity, I may take you as a toy. Chaos got the last one. She said that with an annoyed tone, while I still felt the true anger in her mental words. I didn't wipe the trickle of blood running from my nose. The odds were I need the offering. Now hear me all, she called out, and my eyes closed to try to protect myself from the pain. Corson Monroe will bear witness to the offering of your children and she will owe a debt for the interruption. My debt will be paid by her repairing the damage done. Each of the others will choose the repayment, and as long as she lives, she will fulfill that request. She turned eyes that had the darkness of space on me. Is that clear? Blood ran down from both nostrils now, but I stood straight and nodded my head. Yes, Solistra. Excellent. Officiants, resume. It didn't have the word please, but it sounded more like a request than an order, and it didn't hurt as much. The witnesses to the travesty spread out, encircling the dais and me this time. I walked over to it, climbing up dully as they took their places. I felt tears welling in my eyes. The hippogriff said a sentence, in a long I didn't recognize, but I understood in my head. Once again we join here to offer up these children to the realms. May they be accepted in the manner in which they are given. He glared at me at this part, freely and without doubt. His clawed hands swept down, and I locked my body to prevent myself from leaping forward, from stopping the sacrifice. Three talons touched the top of their heads and drew a single drop of blood each. He flicked it up, and the drops flew into the air. Micro-rips appeared, and the drops flew into them. They are accepted, these children offered by their parents and chosen by the realms will be accepted as focuses for new mages in the Earth realm. Wait, what? Chapter 37 Support for the laws is mandatory as a mage. It is these laws that keep our world civilized. If the laws did not exist, our world would be ruled by many feudal Merlins, using their powers to keep the populace under control. All you need to do is look at North Korea, or some of the African countries, to see the reality of this. All mages must make an effort to stay on the right side of the law, 
The alternative is unthinkable. OMO statement. As I stood there shocked, beans came rushing up, parents, I assumed, and swept up the three babies in their arms, or mandibles. They all shot me looks that should have killed me on the spot. For my part, I just stood there stunned as the wave of beans swept around me. I, but, you, I mean, I stuttered out, unable to form a coherent sentence as the magnitude of my error slicked through me. You what? Celestra hissed right behind me, her heated breath searing my skin. I slowly turned and fought the urge to kneel again. The attention of everyone else on me was enough to make my skin crawl, but I didn't take my eyes off the very deadly, very powerful unicorn. When I heard offered, I choked out the next phrase. I assumed you meant sacrificed. Celestra turned her head, eyeing me with an eye that seemed to expose eternity. I had to resist leaning forward to see into the depths better. They were sacrificed. Their lives were pledged to magic. They will become foci for other unworthy mortals like you. I shook my head, my face on fire from the sheer depth of my stupidity. No, I assumed they were to be killed. A sound rippled through the gathered beans. It wasn't a sharp gasp or a screech or claws and talons scraping along stone. It was all of them, and it sounded like the very world crying out in shock. What? Her voice made me gasp and fall to one knee, both nostrils now trickling blood. Why would you think that? What could ever make you think we would kill our own children? Kill those that are rare and precious? Out of all of us, only the Chitarians give birth in large numbers but they are also eaten in vast quantities. To have one set as a focus from this age, not as choice after adulthood, what greater evidence of respect and power could there be? I was crying now, the pain in my mind feeling like someone had sliced it with glass shards, coated with salt. But I lifted my head to face her. There was no choice. These were actions I had done of my own free will. My human history, and even how we phrase things in magic, we call them offerings or sacrifices. It always means to kill or destroy. When I heard those words, I thought you were about to kill those children. I faced her, tears running down my face and mixing with the blood from my nose. The silence that fell disturbed me, and I wanted to turn to see what these beans were doing but I didn't care to take my eyes off the unicorn. We stood there, staring at each other long enough the blood quit running and started to dry. I have had enough of yours as toys. I should have remembered how incalculably cruel humans can be, and they call us animals and monsters. Celestra leaned forward, her head angled so her features filled most of my vision. We may kill each other. We may eat the child of another. Life is hard and cruel. We may even kill the weakest of our children in times of famine so the others may feed. There is little room for sentiment and coddling in the realms. But never would we kill a child to appease or gain honor. Any being that would ask that is not worth the favor it would grant. I sorrow to think your people still have those that believe life is spent for so little. The image of Carl appeared bright and stark in my mind, with all his horrific beauty. Salistra hissed and reared back, silver cloven hooves pawing the air. The creatures around her, not that anyone had dared to crowd her, backed away even further. That... That is what you do to each other? I didn't know if she'd sought the image, or if I had broadcast it, but either way, her outraged scream had me on my knees, sobbing, blood running from my ears and nose now. If she wasn't careful, her voice alone would kill me. 
I heard a slither of scales, and part of me waited to die. I was about ready to beg for it. My brain was bleeding from the inside out, or at least that's what it felt like. Only the thought of Joe and Sable kept me trying to stand back up. I had to get back. I had to. Enough, Salastra. Your voice is too pure for the chaos of human thoughts. You know this. Look at her. I knew that voice, but I didn't care. Tersane's words coated the wounds in my mind, and I sobbed in relief as the pain ebbed. I remained laying on the warm stone. I heard a snort and assumed it was Salstra, but I didn't look up to verify. The lack of pain had me almost high as my body yo-yoed. Rise up, Corey Monroe. I pushed myself to my feet, even if it felt like I weighed 800 pounds. Standing there swaying, I took in the presence of Tersane. Half the creatures there were bowing, and she waved her hand. In much less time than I would have expected, most of the creatures cleared out, leaving me, the Cerberus, and Hippogriff, and the families, I assumed, which I knew could be very, very wrong, of the children. Tersane dropped to speaking aloud, and I sighed in relief. My brain ached with remembered pain, and all I wanted to do was sleep for a week. You displayed arrogance, fortitude, compassion, and humility. Rarely have I seen that in a mage. Asking questions sooner might be a wise habit to nurture. For now, we must finish the ritual. A drop of their blood was given to magic. You, as her herald, owe them a matching drop. Twenty minutes ago, I might have protested. Ten minutes ago, I might have argued that I never wanted to be magic's herald. Now, all I wanted to do was try and fix my seismic error. Literally. I took her words to heart. How? A smile flittered across her face. Let Arlick nick your finger and grant a drop of blood in each mouth. I looked around, unsure who Arlick was, but the hippogriff stepped forward near the children. I walked over and held out my left hand. I would not have blamed him if he gashed me, but the claw swept down with almost surgical precision and punctured my ring finger. I moved over to where each of the families stood. The Gorgons were easy enough as a woman, half the size of Tersane, held out the cute little thing, and it stuck out its tongue for me to drop blood on it. A simple squeeze and a ruby drop fell. The baby smiled at me and swallowed. The mother, it had obvious breasts, so again I was assuming, pulled it close, smiling with pride. The calf kitten toddled up to me and started to crawl up my pants. The action was so familiar to what Caroline had done once upon a time, I fought not to cry with wanting him here. Glancing at the calf with him, almost as large as Esmir, but with a cream coat and dark markings in burgundy, she almost looked like a Burmese. I picked up the kitten and squeezed a drop of blood. The chocolate brown kitten caught it with its tongue mid-fall, purring. The second the blood was swallowed, squirming commenced, and I set it on the ground in front of the adult calf. You may yet have some redeeming qualities. I didn't know who spoke. The calf was busy grooming the kitten, but it sounded cat-like, which made no sense even in my own head. I turned to the Chitarian. The one from the ceremony sat on its head, while the back of the large or adult Chitarian was covered with what were probably the brothers and sisters of the one offered to magic. It waved one of its many legs at me, and I stepped over to the huge one, trying very hard not to think about the fact that it probably hunted things my size as prey. The baby rose up on hind legs and tilted its body back so its head was facing up. Trusting its choice, I squeezed the drop of blood. It landed on a mandible, and in seconds was gone. Well done. Come, I believe you have a penance to pay. Tersane was next to me, and I hadn't noticed. There had been something strangely sacred about the entire ceremony, making me even more ashamed of my action. I looked around the plaza, 
cringing again at the destruction I'd caused. I didn't have any reason to trust Salastra or the other creatures, but at the exact same time, I had no reason at all to distrust them. The only times I'd been hurt had been by the actions of humans. I'm a moron. I kept that thought to myself, but somehow I suspected Tersane had sensed it. Whatever. I kind of deserved it. You didn't kill anyone, and they would have killed you. Her voice was mild with an odd sibilance to it. Probably her forked tongue. It flickered occasionally as she spoke, giving her words an unearthly accent. I was lucky. I talked to the ground, not her. She still had a presence that even dragons were wary of. Oh, please, you could have suffocated them, broken apart their bones, stopped their hearts. I suspect if you tried, you could have ripped their life out of their bodies. She didn't sound horrified, just vaguely amused. The idea made my blood pressure drop, and I went pale and clammy, as how horrible I could have been struck me. I forced past it. It didn't occur to me. That is part of what makes you so unique. You think of it when calm and logical, but when under pressure or attack, you delay and avoid. You might want to learn more offensive reactions. I glanced at her from under my lashes. Her snakes, still pretty and way too intelligent to just be strands of hair, waved, danced, and winked at me. I dropped my gaze back to my boots, a much safer thing to pay attention to. I don't want to hurt people. I'd prefer to help them. But you are not, what is the word humans use? Ah, pacifist? She said it the way Miss Harmon at my high school said shit, like saying it contaminated you. No, I just don't get any joy from hurting others and would rather not. Good enough. Now, how are you going to fix all the damage you did to Salastra's ordination piazza? I looked around at the damage. Chunks of earth, claw marks, off-kilter pillars, and scattered feathers, and drops of blood where beans had fallen. In through your nose, out through your mouth. Focusing on breathing fully, I mentally chanted the mantra as I looked around. It was nowhere near as bad as what had happened to the campus building when the assassins from Japan attacked me. Here, there had been no roof to collapse, and no one had died, both pluses from my point of view. But the inlaid stone, the tile work, the pretty mosaics had all been damaged, because I didn't keep my mouth shut thinking I knew better. My mouth opened and I snapped it shut, rethinking exactly what she said. Arrogance caused this. Let's see if I could avoid complicating it. Do you have any suggestions? She chuckled, and I dared to look up at her. Inhumanly beautiful, I knew she could become something petrifying in the blink of an eye. I might have one or two. Talk nicely to the earth. It helped build this area. With that, she turned and slithered away. I watched her go and she stopped next to Salstra. The two of them heads together, obviously chatting, but they kept me in their view the entire time. Part of me wanted to sprint to the portal, return to Joe and Sable, try to get back the world I thought I understood. But that would destroy everything I had accomplished, and it was not the person, the dragon, I wanted to be. The blood in runnels from my nose was still fresh, with a sincere solemnness, I offered it to Earth. Please, I need assistance to return this to the beauty it was. Chapter 38 Most of the branches have seven spells that work within magic. Intention and amount of offering can change what any spell is capable of. However, it is still the same basic spell. Psychic only has four defined spells— Truth, telepathy, KO, and memory. There has always been a sense of absolute balance between the branches, yet this one is lacking three spells. What are they, and when or how will they be discovered? 
Magic Explained Online Earth responded to my request with alacrity and joy. It knew what needed to be repaired, and mostly I just needed to get out of its way. The elementals weren't just dumb creatures or spirits or essences, but actual beings. Or was this because of where we were? Either way, I let them have their way and didn't try to override it. No matter how sure I was, it might make things worse. I spent a solid two inches of hair, all the blood from my nose and ears, and had to stop twice for food. The sun never moved, if it was a sun that lit up the area. Tersane and Salastra moved as we worked towards them, and I didn't bug them until I was pretty sure we were done. I sweet-talked air into sweeping the area clean. If there was something that had been missed, I couldn't see it. Hot and sweaty, I made my way over to the two of them. At least if they killed me, I'd die knowing I repaired the damage I had caused. They looked up as I got close enough, and I could tell they quit speaking to each other, even if it was something I couldn't hear as they mind spoke. I couldn't exactly overhear that, yet I could tell. You have completed? Tersane asked, looking around the area. I think so. If I missed anything, please let me know. I offered, looking around. It is well done. Better than I expected. These here know me. This is my place. I am pleased at all their work. Yours, too. Salastra admitted as she surveyed the area. Her words hurt, but not like before. This was a scratch, not a knife. I nodded, not sure what to say. Before I could figure out anything else, she spoke again. You have cleared away my wrath, but you still owe me for the stress you caused my associates. As Tersing gave you a scale, that you may ask a boon. I require the opposite, and you owe the families you distressed. All my oh-shit sensors kicked into high gear, and running for my life seemed like a very good idea, though I had no doubt I'd barely make it two steps. You do know I don't have a way to know if you need me, correct? Currently, that is true. I will mark you, and I will summon you at the point and time that I am in need of your services, and the families will have the same access. Oh, shit. Shit, shit. Provide your arm, the one Tursane marked. The imperious voice allowed no room for refusal or avoidance. I held out my left arm to her, the green puncture marks bright and almost glowing. She turned her body and laid the tip of her horn down beneath the green marks. I hissed in pain and surprise as it seared into me, but it was gone before I could rip my arm away. That is well done, marks you as mine. Each section is for the debt you owe. When the debt is fulfilled, the spaces will fill in. It has more panache than yours does, don't you think, Tersane? Celestra's voice was teasing, with a bite of malice in it. Anyone who thought unicorns were pure and sweet had never met one. I stared at the mark on my wrist, both stunned and horrified. Where Tersane's mark had been two green pinpricks, Salastra's had placed a miniature horn to the right of the punctures. It glared a painful red, though the pain was already fading. As I watched, it faded and went to a silvery outline of a unicorn horn with four sections. It ended up looking like a high-end tattoo or scarification. I really wanted to growl, but again, I knew I earned this. Indeed, it is a beautiful mark. I think I should make mine match. Those words had barely registered before Tersane had my wrist in an iron grip with her left hand, while her right drew a waving line the same length as Salastra's horn. What are you- I started, then hissed out as pain and pleasure bubbled up under my skin, where her finger traced. Before I could breathe in again, a brilliant green serpent, spade-shaped head and all, appeared over the two green dots. It looked like a real snake about to move, its tail curving around my forearm. That looks much better. She purred, smirking at Salastra. 
Her fingers let go of my arm, and I stared at the new designs. They were like looking at two different pieces of art, side by side. One, a snake that looked like the ones on Tersane's head. The other, a miniature unicorn horn that even sparkled. At least they are pretty. Getting more tattoos hadn't been on my list, but I wasn't stupid enough to complain. Instead, I stood and watched both of them preen a bit. Am I good to head back? I still didn't even know if I'd passed or failed, but since Salastra wanted a future favor, I hoped it meant I had passed, even by my own estimation. However, it was only by a whisker. Tersine and Salastra ended their smirk off and changed their focus to me. Maybe I should have let them keep up with their one-upmanship, except I was afraid I was becoming their doodle pad. Ah, oh, yes, the Magelene's challenge... She turned her horsey, well, unicorny head, one way, then the other, looking at me. She did what I requested, and she allowed the ceremony to proceed. I only had to grit my teeth while she spoke. Either she was being nice, or I was getting used to her brand of agony. I had no idea which option was better. It is rather well done, I think, Salastra, and she did it in much less time than the last offender, she set aside her own ideas. Most can't. Their egos demand they are correct, much like others we know. Again, that teasing. I couldn't decide if their relationship reminded me of a married couple or sisters, but there was a long relationship with a history there. My mind shut off before I could follow that path any further. Some possibilities did not need to be thought about at all. True. But she still owes me for the travesty. Excitement. She brought to the ritual. Salastra continued, but now her words were almost like two hard scratches. Not comfortable, but not really painful. I needed to go before their teasing got violent. I didn't think I could survive violent. And you marked her? I shot a sharp look at Tersane. There was something behind the words I didn't understand, and that worried me. A lot. Salastra snorted and scraped the ground with one hoof. Corey Monroe, marks go both ways. If you believe you are in serious risk of dying before you have fulfilled your debts, that mark will call me. Do not think I will let you leave this plane of existence without clearing our debts. Yes. I floundered for a second. What by Merlin's beard did I call her? Salistra? I couldn't figure out any other word. Not and keep my heart in my body. Humans, I hope this is the right thing. Why did she not choose someone sensible like Bane Jarl? I blinked at the grousing from Salistra. I don't know why, but it sounded like pouting. Why would a super-powerful, unicorn-like creature pout? You know why. The same reason it is neither of us, or Esmir, or even... My mind spasmed as she said a name I didn't recognize, but I recognized the pain. The thing from chaos. Assuming I had followed their conversation correctly, they were talking about any of them being heralds of magic. While I would be totally fine with Banyarl, the idea of Esmir, or that thing that was chaos being the herald, suddenly made me a much better choice. I loved Esmir, but she had no qualms about anything she wanted. A squirrel, she'd kill and eat it, even if it spoke to her. If her claws needed sharpened, she'd use whatever she wanted. The damage was the item's problem, not hers. Carolyn at least understood ownership and didn't actively damage things. But Esmir would destroy cities just to see what happened. Thankfully, she didn't seem to be that powerful. Or I'm completely wrong, and she's a demigod like the rest. I mean, what is a Chaos Lord? On that thought, my mind locked up and decided leaving was the best option. I am so grateful for what you have taught me. Perhaps it is a good time for me to leave? Back through the fire portal? I asked, waving at the only end of the triangle without built-in seating. 
The fire still flickered merrily along it, and at this point, offering more to fire to get out of there was more than worth it. Tersane turned her perfect visage to me. For a second of sheer terror, I thought I was going to experience her other expression, the one that created statues. Yes, go. I am sure we will be talking soon. Oh, Merlin, I hope not. I blurted, then slapped my hand over my mouth, eyes wide as I stared at her. I'm dead. She's going to kill me. Oh, Merlin. Salastra started laughing, the shreds of laughter cutting into my mind, and several of Tersane's snakes were bouncing in what looked like hysterics. Even your favorites worry about your looks. Salastra jabbed, and I forgot my mortification at the flash of pain I saw flicker across Tersane's face. Hey, that is not nice. Tersane is gorgeous. I blurted out, horrified that she thought I didn't like her because of her statue look. I'm not worried about her looks, or even the fact that she could turn me to stone. I'm terrified because she is powerful, gorgeous, a fracking demigod, and seems to be intrigued by me. Mortals don't live long when powers are interested in them. And I'd like to die of old age in my bed, thank you very much. But don't you think for a second that I have an issue with how she looks. My only issue with her is she's so damn intimidating. Even the leaves quit rustling, and I felt every being, spirit, every creature shift their attention to me as I realized what I had done. I just told off a demigod. For a moment, a long, multiple, rapid heartbeat moment, I thought about running, about ripping open the earth and fading into it, or even just willing myself dead. Then, I thought about being a dragon, and decided to tell everyone to take a flying leap. I glared at Salastra. You're being mean. I don't know why everyone thinks unicorns are so nice, because, frankly, you're being a snotty bitch. And I think you know your mind speak causes actual brain damage, and you don't care. I didn't like girls like you in high school, and just because you're a unicorn demigod, you're still a bitch. The silence remained, and I stood there, hands on my hips, glaring at the unicorn. Silken white eyelids blinked once, then twice over eyes that held eternity. Then Salastra turned to Tersane, who had the strangest expression on her face. I see why you like her. At this rate, she might grow on me too. It's been a very long time since there's been anything but sycophants. Aye, since we were kidlings, Tersane said, but she didn't take her eyes off me, and neither did any of her snakes. Keep her, and I won't break her. Be gone, both of you. I have things to do. Without another glance our way, Salstra pivoted on her hind hooves and trotted out of the area leaving a few strands of hair behind. I would collect those. Unicorn hair is handy for many things, and she never sheds without a purpose. Tersane's voice was mild, but she still had a funny expression. Embarrassed and still a bit offended on her behalf, I bent and snapped up the hairs, stuffing them in a pocket and sealing the Velcro. I'll walk you back she said as she slithered to the portal. I had to walk briskly to keep up, and for some reason I felt like she wanted to ask me something, but we got to the portal and she stopped. Enter and walk back. You should find the path home shorter than to get here. Thanks. I turned then stopped. I'd been teased about my clumsiness, my parents, for Joe, Even my name, Cory Catastrophe, said what people thought. I'd grown past it, but as a kid, it had hurt. Joe still flinched at some words. Gorgeous she might be now, but middle school had been a hell of acne, weight, body changes, and dealing with brothers. I don't know what your people regard as pretty. Lots of humans find snakes scary, but even with the snakes, which I think are cute, you're stunning and men and women would fall over themselves to be with you. But we're humans. We are cruel and stupid. Don't judge yourself on anything we say. I sighed, no longer sure where I was going with this. (sighs) Just, I think you're really pretty and scary and powerful, and you make a great role model. 
I spun and walked into the fire, refusing to look back at the demigod standing there watching me. Chapter 39 The unicorn that was captured over a year ago has escaped captivity. The handler swore it just stepped to the side and was gone, but no rips into either realm have been detected, and the holding pen was layered with sensitive equipment. The question is, did the unicorn truly escape, and will we need to deal with another rampage of men being killed, or has it gone back to its realm? Atlanta News I headed through the arch and prepared myself for the long plod back to where the others waited for me, but three steps in, and I hit the grass and the orderly chimes. A quick look around convinced me I was in the right place, and I headed straight to where Carolyn sat watching, or guarding, Joe and Sable. Carolyn! It came out as a shout of glee, and I dropped to my knees, yanking him into my arms. Corey, what is wrong? Worry was clear in his tone, and I realized I was shaking. Breathe. Find out what happens next. I shook my head, buried in his fur. Later. I gathered myself back together and lifted my head, looking for Hamadia. She stood by the statues, glaring, and for a moment I thought she was talking to someone. Confused and a bit worried, I watched her. Two foot stomps later... She flowed over to me, her feet not really walking, more skating across the grass. They said you made it. They weren't sure about you originally, but they admired your conviction of purpose and willingness to see the error in your ways. They? I had a very good idea, but as I had so very recently learned, assuming could get me and others dead. Salstra, Tursane and the families, though even... She said the chaos creature's name, and I flinched. How could you pronounce someone's name like that? Weighed in on what the verdict was. She pouted. You passed. The tension that dropped out of me made my entire body feel boneless. I slumped back against Carolyn. I did? I just said that, didn't I? She sounded offended and exasperated and I didn't care, at all. Then release them, now. I stood, my body quivering with the need to have Joe and Sable free. I pulled off my pack and dropped it on the ground, sighing as the weight dropped off me. If she had been a teenager, a huff and sigh would have followed her slogging over to the two pillars of light. Himadia placed one hand on each of the pillars and closed her eyes. I watched, trying to see both of them at the same time. They lowered to the ground, still looking like they were perfectly asleep. The light disappeared, and I rushed to Joe. Check Sable, Carolyn. I snapped. I needed to make sure they were both okay, but I couldn't check on both of them at the same time. He was moving before I'd hit the ground with my knees, my hand on her throat. A strong, steady pulse met my touch, and I felt half the stress vaporize. But was she still Joe? Hey, Joe, can you hear me? I need you to wake up, please. I didn't even try to cover up my stress or quavering voice. My breath held as I gently touched her face. Joe, the word was an exhalation of hope and need. She groaned a bit and turned her head. I remembered to breathe as she moved her shoulders and lifted her hand to her temple, rubbing. Corey? What are you doing back? She muttered the words, her eyes squeezed shut tight. Why does it feel like Jose Corvo beat the daylights out of me? My self-control fled, and I yanked her into my arms and started crying. Moments later, I heard Sable's voice, and then I felt her arms wrap around me. Warmth and safety surrounded me as I let the tears flow, and I held them tight. My family... They just held me and let me cry out the stress and fear. Carolyn pushed his way into the circle of arms, purring like Joe's motorcycle when it was out of sync. It took a bit until my tears dried up and the arms loosened. I looked up through puffy eyes and smiled at Joe and Sable. I am so glad to see you two. I've missed you both. 
Joe and Sable glanced at each other, then back at me. I get the feeling something major happened, Joe finally said, her eyes sweeping across the clearing and lingering on the form of Hamadia still pouting over by the statues. What is the last thing you remember? I asked as I pulled my bag over. And are you hungry? Joe opened her mouth, then paused, frowning. Starving, actually. Now I'm more confused. I just nodded and pulled out the salami, nuts, and dried fruit, handing it to them. Joe tossed some almonds in her mouth, frowning in thought. We had just eaten dinner and were sitting on the back porch. Sable nodded as she grabbed some of the dried cranberries. Yeah, it had been a nice day. We were talking about going to bed, then exploring more tomorrow. She paused and frowned. And then... Her words broke off as the furrow between her brows got deeper. Joe nodded. Right? And then... She chewed on some salami, and her brows creased. And then I don't know. The next thing I remember is you and here. Same. I don't remember anything, Sable admitted. So, what happened? I turned and stared lasers into Hamadia. I don't know. What happened? The dryad quit pretending to be ignoring us and glided back over. Nuts, she demanded, imperiously holding out her hand. I blinked at her tone, but shrugged, and I handed over more almonds. The smoked kind. They were the best. She tossed one in her mouth. Hmm, this is tasty. With a movement that implied she had no bones, she dropped into a lotus pose, vivid green eyes staring at us. I realized she had no pupils, and I didn't know if that creeped me out or if I wanted to ask a lot more questions. Corey, what happened? And who are you? Joe asked, her body tense, eyes locked on Hamadia. Joe, Sable, meet Hamadia, your kidnapper and the house, who is now going to tell us what happened? I asked, eyes narrowed as I focused on her. The house? Sable asked, her voice unsure. Please, like you've never seen a house hosting an entity before. You make flat, moving stories about them. Himadia protested, reaching for more nuts. Those aren't real, and usually those houses tend to kill people, Joe pointed out. Humans are confusing. How do you know what is real or not when it plays in that box? There's no person there to truth sense. So... Is it all real or all not? She looked frustrated and unsure. That way lay long discussions, and I didn't want to deal with it right now. Himadia, I'll try to explain later. Right now, what did you do to them? Himadia looked away, the first sign of shame or discomfort I'd seen in her. I entranced them. It is easy with a few spores I released, and I called them up the stairs. Then they just walked into my realm via the portal in the top floor. They were set in a stasis, and then I waited. Waited for what? Joe demanded. For Corey Monroe to show up and attempt the trials. The two women looked at each other, then me, then back at Himadia. Are you saying we were bait? Demanded Joe. Yes, and the reward and punishment. She needed to be properly motivated which is unusual as most leap at the chance to be ingratiated with magic, she did not. Hence, motivation. She said all of this like I would have said, put on a coat to prevent getting cold. It chilled me. Jo nailed me with her stare and her eyes slowly traveled over me, noting every scratch, bump, torn bit of clothing, and the random vaporization of hair. Corey... What by Merlin's name happened to you? Carolyn all but crawled in my lap, hard when he weighed almost as much as I did, his purring sending vibrations through my body. I took a deep breath and then started to talk. Joe and Sable and even Hamadia listened with rapt attention. Even though I wanted to gloss over or completely avoid certain aspects of the tests, I didn't. I was honest about the temptation to trade in their lives for those books, about my indignation and rage at the sacrifice of children. But most of all, 
about my fear that I would fail and that Joe and Sable wouldn't be set free unharmed. Oh, I would have set them free. They wouldn't have remembered anything about the time they lost, but I wouldn't have hurt them, assured Hamadia. It didn't help. Though it seems the wrong test for wrath was chosen. You don't care about yourself enough to exact vengeance, but for others, for children, what would you have done? Her head was tilted, and she was curious. Should I answer her? I was very certain Tersane and Salstra were listening, but all of this might be yet another test. I was so tired of people testing me. Honesty, never lie. Just be selective with the truth. I would have rescued them and got them to people who would protect them. I admitted. But would you have come back and punished the offenders? She prodded, watching me, and the skin on the back of my neck crawled. Not the way you mean. If I had needed to kill to rescue the kids, I probably would have. But I doubt I would have come back just to kill them. And torture is just tacky. And if you knew they would do it again? Or to different children? I opened my mouth, shut it, sat there for a moment, and sighed. <sighs> I don't know. In my world, I go to the authorities, tell them, and let them deal with it. Let justice work. But here... I never know if I'm making the right choices, and some of them I don't think I could live with. Standing there when I thought the kids were about to be killed was one of the hardest things I've ever done. If they had actually been killed, I don't know if I could have handled it. I shrugged. I probably ask Esmir or Bainarl or... I touched my necklace, the scale from Tersane. The problem is, I don't know if I'd like the answer. Do you really think so little of us? Tersane's voice from behind me didn't surprise me at all. In some ways, it was almost a relief. No, but Esmir and Bainyarl and Carolyn have always made it clear that life here has different rules and expectations than on Earth. The test reinforced it beyond a doubt. I turned as I spoke to watch her slither towards us. I held out some salami as she curled up near our little group. Joe and Sable nodded at her, wary, but she dropped in occasionally at Bainyarl's teaching, kind of like having the president stop by. You were honored, but concerned about why he would be there. Did Salastra come? I asked, scanning the area. No, she has damaged you enough for one day. Human minds are not made to withstand how her thoughts are formed. You are too fragile for sustained conversations. What is this? It is most delightful. She held up the piece of meat she was delicately chewing on. That's salami. I glanced between her and Hamadia, who had scooted over a bit, giving her space. You helped with all of this. These tests, didn't you? It was almost an accusation, but I kept it a question. Of course, I marked you. I would have been offended if I was not invited to participate, she said as she picked up a smoked almond and inspected it. But Gory passed, right? She's safe? There are no more tests, Joe asked, her hand on my knee tightening. Tersing popped the last almond in her mouth, eyes closed as she chewed. I could feel the anxiety radiating off of Joe and Sable, but I was almost calm. I'd done my best. At this point, if I failed, they were safe. Yes, we are satisfied with where she is. There will be no more tests from us. She is acknowledged as a herald by magic. Many times, those watching thought you would fail. I never did, however. Those I choose rarely fail. Her snake swerved to look at me. Have you not looked at your wrist? I looked at my wrist with the snake and the unicorn horn. These mean I'm a herald? That made no sense. I thought they were just proofs of more hooks into my soul. You two have two wrists, do you not? I held up my right arm, yanked up the long sleeve, and stared. There, encircling my wrist, were the magical symbols repeated three times. Spirit, order, chaos and a bracket around my wrist. 
All the branches that I was strong in were filled with a vivid rainbow of colors, shifting from one to another, while all my pale branches had the pastel version filling them. My knolls reflected only my skin, with the faintest of an opalescence sheen. How the... Even as I spoke, it pulsed once and faded, becoming a tattoo on my skin, only visible by careful inspection. Magic marks her own. Any denizen of the realms will see it and react accordingly. Her voice bland as she nibbled on a piece of pepperoni this time, her slitted pupils dilating. What exactly does that mean? Joe asked. I was still staring at my wrist. The symbols brightened and became clearly visible when I ran my finger over them, but faded away in seconds. It means what it means. Much depends on Corey Monroe and the choices she makes. Magic has made hers. With that ominous statement, Tersane rose to her full height and slithered away, disappearing between one slither and the next. I like her better than Salastra, but anyone that can drink your magic dry on a whim is not a comfortable person to have in your home. Hamadia sat up straighter, grinning. Are you ready to go back to your realm? What do you mean, drain you dry? Like a vampire? I didn't think they were real. Sable managed, torn between horrified and curious. I was about the same. Tersing was a vampire? Hamadia shook her head. Vampires do not exist unless someone created them recently. All of the exalted have the right to drain others. How do you think they rose to exalted? I just stared at her. I had no idea how to even process that information, and trying to figure out realm politics when I was still struggling with earth politics sounded like an excuse for a headache. I'm ready. Are you? I looked at the two women whose lives I valued more than my own. Very. We've been here too long, Joe said, and Sable nodded in agreement. Hamadia, can you take us home? And maybe tomorrow show us how to help take care of you? It is your home also. I caught the confused looks from Joe and Sable, but I let it go. I'd explain later. Of course. I am linked. She flowed upwards and looked over to where the statues had been. Now there was a simple door, with a frame standing as if grown from the grass. I pulled myself up, packed up the food stuff, and pulled my pack on. We headed for the door, so anxious to be out of this place. I paused at the edge, hand almost reaching for the knob. You're sure? Home? No tricks? Himadia stood up straight, then bowed. Home. You have been here long enough. It is time for you to return to your own realm. My hand wrapped around the doorknob. How long have I been here? I pulled it towards me and smiled as a familiar room appeared. I believe 38 of your hours. I shivered. No wonder I'm exhausted. Why not I? Hungry, but I feel energized almost. Joe protested as we walked into the third floor of the house. Because you've been in the dandy pillar of light, sleeping the sleep of the innocent. Must be nice. I didn't grouse, just added sarcasm. A lot of sarcasm. Are you coming too, Hamadia? I asked as we tramped into the room. Carolyn slunk in behind us while Joe and Sable headed to the stairs. Himadia paused on the threshold, her head tilted. Why is there pounding on my door? Huh? Corsan Monroe, come out with your hands up. This is your last warning. The sound of an amplified voice echoed through the room. Chapter 40 an effort is being made to retrace the voyage of Odysseus. As Troy was found, it has been suggested that maybe Circe and the two monsters, Charybdis and Scylla, may have actually been guardians at semi-permanent portals into the other realms. If they could be found, it would give scientists two points of entry, as the odds are the portals would be in international waters. Magic Explained Online Merlin's balls, what now? I was so tired I wanted to cry. My entire body ached from hitting the ground so many times, 
and I still didn't know how to deal with all the world-changing information I'd received today. What is it? Joe moved over and looked out the window with me. Merlin, what did you do, Corey? My stomach sank. We'd been gone over 30 hours. A whole day had passed. A day where I hadn't answered the phone or the door or had been reachable by anyone. Himadia, did anyone come in while I was gone? Or in your realm? I asked. Maybe Stephen and Indira had gotten my note. No, the house was sealed as soon as you stepped into my realm. No one could get in or out. Each word made me shrink down a bit more. It just solidified, especially when I spied Stephen and Indira in the crowd, as well as Detective George Farlin. Oh, this is going to suck, I muttered and headed to the stairs. Corey, what's going on? Joe followed right behind me. So, I was working with the police when Marisol called and let me know you'd missed her talking to her. Oh shit, that's right. Ugh, mommy's going to strangle me. Joe groaned, trotting down the steps with me. Yeah, well, I headed back here ASAP. I'd already been a bit worried about the two of you not responding, but I kept telling myself it was because you were having sex or exploring. We don't have that much sex, Sable protested, but I saw Joe blush a little. Uh Uh-huh, I murmured. Well, they said something about it being illegal for me to leave, but I kind of left anyhow. I guess they were being over-anxious because I left. I dropped my bag on the entryway floor and quickly pulled my hair into a ponytail with a scrunchie from the table. When three women all have long hair, scrunchies are everywhere. I approached and peered out the door, sucking in a sharp breath as I saw everything that was laid out front on my lawn. Not only were Stephen and Indira there, standing by their car across the street, but Detective Farlin was there, a bunch of people with the letters OMO on their jackets, FBI, draft dept, reporters, soldiers, and there were mages. What in the world is going on? Um, Corey, Sable said, her voice worried. All this is because you left? I guess they were more serious than I thought about me not leaving. Stay here, and I'll deal with it, I said as I set my hand on the door handle. Oh, I don't think so. This is our fault. Well, we were the ones taken, so we're going with you. Joe had her, I'm not bending, expression, and Sable just nodded, her arms across her chest. I glanced at Himadia. You coming too? Her face had darkened, becoming woodier. She closed her eyes, and I felt like she was seeing more than we did. No, but I shall watch. This is my body, and I do not wish it harmed. They have machines and weapons that imply structural damage. I will be wrathful if that should occur. With one more glare towards the front yard, she faded into the wall with a single backward step. Huh, nice trick. I muttered and pulled on the door. To my relief, it opened up easily. I'd almost been scared we would still be trapped inside. I stepped out onto the porch and froze as multiple guns were lifted up and aimed at me. Um, hi? I couldn't manage any more than that. The intimidation factor of having soldiers point guns at you, cop cars surrounding your house like you were a drug runner for some cartel, and the sheer number of federal agencies here, now all staring at me, made my mind go blank. A tall, thin man in a dark windbreaker that said draft in the corner lifted up the bullhorn and started to speak. Corsan Monroe, you are ordered to give yourself up for violation of... I put my hand up in a stop gesture. You're ten feet away from me. I can hear you just fine. What is going on? There was a snicker behind me, and I glanced over my shoulder to see Joe on one side of me. I took a quick peek over the other shoulder, and Sable stood there, both of them with their arms crossed, looking impressive and powerful. Carolyn hadn't stuck his head out of the house yet. I should have changed back into my new clothes. Oh well. The agent lowered his bullhorn, but he didn't look amused. You are under arrest for violation of Section 32.3 of the Mage Draft Treaty. If you are found guilty of violation... 
you can be sentenced to 20 years of draft, or if you're regarded as unrepentant and dangerous, the penalty is death. His hard voice sent shivers down my spine, but I had taken time to double-check the law before I'd stepped into Himadia's domain. That is not accurate, I said, pretending I was a dragon, unconcerned about mortals. It didn't really work, but the image helped to keep me from freaking out. The wording of that section says the mage may not leave the state or be unreachable for trial pending extreme extenuating circumstances. I am reachable now, and the trial should be tomorrow? I offered, hopefully. It looked like it was mid-morning, and if I'd been gone thirty or so hours, assuming Hamadia was right about the time difference, the trial should be tomorrow. I hoped the trial was tomorrow. Stephen had moved up next to the agent and was speaking in low whispers. I watched all of this more than a bit worried inside. Agent Dude brushed Stephen off and another OMO person pulled him away. My worry spiked. The man all but spat his reply at me. The trial was this morning, and you have been out of communication for over 48 hours. The rogue mage was put to death this morning, even without your witness testimony. You are being detained in violation of the Mage Draft Treaty. His tone brooked no compromise, and annoyance started to battle with worry. I'm sorry, but I had an extenuating circumstances issue and had to come here, a place that is within the state, and my liaison with the NYPD knew where I was coming back to. I made sure my voice carried and kept my hands still. Not that it mattered much, but most mages made funny gestures when doing magic. Banyarl thought that was ridiculous. You have violated the draft terms and conditions. Surrender now, he barked and I bristled. I have not entered the draft, so I haven't violated anything. I snapped back, and Alexant tried to talk to him again, but was shaken off. I'd never seen anyone blow off Steve and Alexant like that, and I saw him getting both angry, and what chilled me more, worried. Immaterial. You will surrender now and be taken into custody. All of you. His order made me tense more, Joe and Sable have nothing to do with this. Leave them out of it. Now I was starting to get freaked out, too. This entire thing was ridiculous. I had no desire to go against the might of the draft board or the OMO. No one won those fights. It was a death sentence. They are charged with aiding and abetting. He started. I interrupted him. What? They were... They were... I faltered, looking at them. What was I supposed to say? A dryad that was, or is my house, kidnapped them to pull me here? They were in distress, and I needed to assist them. I finally managed. He ran his eyes over them, then flicked them back to me. They are uninjured. Charges stand. Why won't you listen? I had to go. They are fine now, but there wasn't an option. I don't think but then I might not have been rational. The guns pointed at me didn't lower, and I could see the mages in the back dressed in military uniforms, the colors on their temples dead giveaways that they were mages. In fact, the more I looked, I saw most of them out there had tattoos, except Bullhorn Guy. This was very not good. Immaterial. This will be decided by judge. Surrender! His voice harsh, Alexant pulled away from the others and grabbed Bullhorn Guy, talking fast and urgent. I gave in. Joe, can you ask Air to pull sound to us? I need to hear what he's saying. Out of my peripheral view, I saw her nod her head, and in a split second, words were carried to my ears on the breeze. Alexant hissed out the words. Quit threatening her. She's very powerful and young. She might overreact. The government wants her skill set intact. She owes them a decade, and they'd rather have a willing and enthusiastic mage in their service, rather than a resentful one, or worse, a dead one. Air brought his words in a rush around my head. For the last time, get out of here. Otherwise, I'll have you arrested for obstruction. I know how to deal with power-hungry mages. 
bullets work wonders. If she won't listen, I'll take care of the matter personally. What your masters want doesn't matter. Only making sure order is maintained does. Rogue mages are dangerous to everyone. You are obviously compromised. I would have felt better. Still shocked and upset, but better if he'd had any emotion at all in his voice. My phone had more personality. Lufon, Alexant whispered, but this time he was all but dragged away by more people with flashy windbreakers, and the cold in my stomach turned into a snowball. A huge one rolling into my soul. I don't have an issue with coming with you. Just let everyone else go. I knew Kerling could flee where they could never catch him, but Joe and Sable? Maybe I had destroyed their lives. Keeping my hands in the air, I started down the steps. My heart raced as I tried to figure out not only what I should do, but how in the hell had it come to this? It wasn't like I'd run away from my duties, but rescuing Joe and Sable wasn't negotiable. Corey, no, we aren't letting them take you. Joe lunged forward and grabbed my right arm. This can't be legal, she protested, her face a sickly pale. Take them out. Resisting arrest. All of them. We can't afford to have rogue mages. The agent ordered into his earpiece. I heard the breath of the sniper, air rushing around like crazy to inform me of what was happening. And something inside me broke. Maybe it was the desire to play by the rules. Maybe it was my faith that if I did the right thing, others would. Or maybe it was just my ability to give a fuck. I yanked on earth hard, offering blood, and I shook the earth in the immediate vicinity, knocking everyone off their feet. As that threw up earth and dust into the air, I grabbed it and created a shield around the house, at least three feet thick. Tell me, I whispered. If anything tries to come through, then stop it. I offered hair and blood, which earth inhaled like a fine whiskey. Trying to kill me or my friends is a bad idea. I'll talk to a magistrate, but you have just proven you can't be trusted. Leave now. Come back when someone who can negotiate is willing to. I spoke the words loud and clear, still hoping they'd see sense and back down. Rogue mage protocol, activate, was snapped out instead. Oh, what is wrong with people? I muttered, even as guilt assaulted me. I could see Alexant talking frantically on his phone, and Indira, paler than the clouds, leaning against the car. Carolyn, I said, my voice low. Tell Indira and Stephen to shield, please. I had been thinking about what Tersing said. They never taught us how to really use magic offensively in our magic classes. It was all science, measurement, offerings, and exact results. But Tersing had kick-started thoughts in my mind. Banyarl had been more interested in making sure we understood that magic wasn't all weights and measurements, that magic was magic, not the science that humans tried to make it. And I knew all the things you could do to the body to heal with magic, or to harm. They're ready, he said. My queens will show them they are not to be messed with. I knew Joe and Sable could hear him, their pale faces proof. Hold on. This is going to get rocky. I'm sorry. I felt tears starting to well up in my eyes. I was too young to die, and definitely not over this stupid stuff. We aren't going anywhere. Tell us what to do. Joe said, her voice strong and almost gleeful. I glanced back at her and saw a warrior, hands full of fire and death in her eyes. On my other side stood Wrath Incarnate. Sable's ebony eyes glittered with rage, with water summoned from the air. They won't know what hit them. Terrified glee bubbled up, and I sent out the strongest wide KO I could. It washed through the assembled forces, decimating them. One in ten still stood, swaying a bit, and terror had leached through them. Joe, ignite the powder in the bullets. Sable, water in all their electronics. See if you can spare Alexan and Indira, but fry everything. I snapped. Carolyn, prepare us escapes. If we have to flee, take us to spirit. Ask Banyarl if he'll shelter us. Otherwise, I pull the entire damn house out of time. We won't leave her behind for them to hurt. You would protect him, Maria? 
he asked. Bullets started to fizzle and poof, making everyone still awake jump back from the dangerous objects. Joe was good, and she knew her mechanics, which means there wasn't shrapnel flying everywhere, but little puffs as she controlled the burn. Meanwhile, sparks were starting to fly out of phones and radios, even some of the cars. Sable had a wicked grin as she concentrated. Unfortunately, Bullhorn Guy didn't go down. Take out the threat, now! He bellowed, spinning to stare at the line of mages near the back. They had blocked more of my KO than the rest. Merlin's piss! I swore under my breath. There had been eight mages back there, and from here I could see that five of them were Merlins. All order or chaos. Only one had dropped from my KO. Fine. I'd go to the next step though it completely would blow away the idea that I couldn't effectively use my null branches. They brought up hands, and I felt magic flying at me. As it hit my earthen shield, I identified it. Entropy. Fire. Narrow like a laser. A water dehydration spell. And a disrupt. There were two more I didn't recognize, but I doubled up on my shield and yanked on the earth again. I was working really hard to not destabilize the tectonic plates, I just wanted, needed, localized earth movement, but there was a huge chance I'd cause a sinkhole. A wisp of some sort of magic blew through my shield and slammed into me. I screamed and hit my knees. I had thought Salastra's words hurt. This felt like my mind was having a flaming needle rammed through it. Stroke attack, Joe snapped. Remember Banyarl told us about that. You know what to do, Sable. Find the clot and dry it out so small it crumbles into individual cells her body can handle. We practiced this. Got it, I heard her say. I kept my eyes closed, breathing through the pain, but I felt others getting ready to attack. My magic sense bubbled up all over the place, and I could tell we would crumble. Hurry. Only chance. Time bubble. Huge. Big. I knew how to do it in theory, but the offering would be huge and I'd have to make it way out of sync, like a year or more. It might kill me, but it would take them years to find the match, if they ever did, if I set the bubble far enough out of sync. Shush, give me a second. Sable said the words soothingly, but her hands on either side of my head were clammy and cold. Fire, incoming, I got it. Joe reached out and took over the fire, something most mages didn't know was possible. If you asked the elemental in it, they loved bouncing to someone who would talk to them, not just order them around. She let it hang in the air, creating yet another layer of shielding. Shit, more coming, Sable muttered. They're working with entropy, trying to break down the shield and the house. No! I jerked up and swayed, but pushed past it, I had to believe Sable had done enough to let my body heal on its own. Magic could do that if it needed to. Kirtlian, get us those escapes. I'll try to get the time bubble to be big enough for us. I didn't mention I also needed it long enough for them to not get to us easily. And that if I wasn't careful, the time sink would kill me. Chapter 41 Stare not too long in the depths of your worst thoughts, for then you will see them come alive in the actions of others. Chin Lin Proverb I felt a slash of pain as Carolyn opened a portal. I shook it off as I tried to create a bubble. I needed it big enough to grab the house and the backyard and throw us at least a year out of sync. I'd never done anything that big before. My default was five minutes, and it had only taken the beans in the order realm a few seconds to sync up and find the time displacement. But a year? A year would take forever, and when I was ready to end it, I'd age a year and then some. I could live with that, if I could cast it. I could feel magic building. Whatever they were about to hit us with would be devastating. I should never have let Joe and Sable come out here with me. I reached for the magic and pulled, offering anything it wanted, and it failed. I sat there stunned. Magic had never failed for me. I hadn't known it could, and I didn't have time to figure out why it failed. 
but I suspected it had something to do with the house, or maybe the open portals Caroline was talking through. Either way, it had failed. All of you, step to the other realms. I'll give myself up and see if I can protect the house and you. I had a crazy idea, to throw them forward in time. It might kill me, but I'd read a story where a mage put their children ten years forward in time to protect them. They could go anywhere then. Bane Earl would help, right? I wasn't sure it was even more than a theory. There were so many things I should be doing, could be doing, but I needed to delay to give everyone time to calm down. Joe and Sable were hapless victims, and I'd make sure everyone knew that. My shield crumbled. Air whispered words to me. A spell I'd forgotten was running, carrying Bullhorn's voice to my ear. Take out the two women. I want them to be examples. I jerked my head up and screamed. No! Images of Joe bleeding out in my arms, but this time she wouldn't be okay. Sable's head exploding as a bullet exploded out of her. Panic and the last vestiges of caring about looking mild turned to dust. Power flew out of me in a wave of electricity at hurricane force that slammed into people like a million zaps of static and cars lit up as they were hit. You will not hurt my friends. I swallowed and prepared to cross a line I had never wanted to cross. I couldn't torture people, and there were lots of options that would leave people blind or maimed, but that seemed worse than killing them outright. When you learn how to save people, you also learn how to kill them. I closed my eyes, focusing on what I needed to do. The best offensive mages were always elementalists. Fire, water, air. They all could kill without an issue. I only had a strong earth, and that tended to damage everything, rather than just the person or persons trying to kill you. I was strong in soul, relativity, time, and psychic. Of those, only soul could kill. The others just weren't meant to be used that way. Pale and entropy meant I had access to age. It wasn't one they talked about much in school, but I'd read it in the Magic Explained books. Marisol got me, for an emergence gift. I'd only thought about using it for making bacteria or viruses grow faster in mediums for experiments. But now, I'd use it to kill people to protect my family. All I had to do was age out the heart values until they crumbled away. Fast, relatively tiny, and even with entropy as pale, with Caroline helping, I had the power. I'm sorry. I whispered and pulled up my offering. Three hard slashes of pain disrupted my concentration, and I scrambled to get it again. I didn't have time. They would kill Joe and Sable at any moment. Stop! The word locked down my body as it rolled across the lawn as if it was thunder rolling across the sky. All of the people out there, the ones trying to destroy me and my family, locked up, some falling to the ground if they had been in motion when the word hit. The slashes of pain faded, becoming sensitive areas in my mind, and it registered that three portals had opened. Three huge portals. Oh, crap. I couldn't speak. I couldn't move. I couldn't even mind speak. Yet Carolyn brushed past me, his tail tracing a velvet path across my face. He trotted down the stairs to the lawn. I could move my eyes, and I followed his path as he stopped and took the Egyptian pose at the base of the stairs. You humans are more than a bit annoying. Why, you have been given the gift of magic. I will never understand. The crystal shard voice of Salstra cut through my mind, and I had a tiny bit of sympathy for the people out there who had never felt the pain of her mind voice before. Sit and listen, or I swear I will remove the edicts that constrain access to this world. The voice that held me in place relaxed, and I could sit up, but it wouldn't let me stand and I saw numerous people being forced to sit. I could see Indira and Stephen on the ground near each other. She was as pale as an eggnog latte, while Stephen was wary. I could see the whites of his eyes. 
A few soldiers tried to lift guns, but they seemed unable to even pull them out of holsters or aim them up. The best they could do was move them so they could sit comfortably. They probably forgot Joe destroyed all their bullets, or maybe they didn't even realize she did. I searched for the mages and saw them all crumpled, holding their heads as if in the midst of the world's worst headache. Huh, I wonder if mages hurt more from her voice. I heard, or more accurately felt, movement from around the side of the house, approaching from the lawn. The ground shook, not like a mage was moving it, but more from the vibration of something very big stepping on it. As I came around the side of the house, I tasted, or smelled something awful. It felt like castor oil coating the inside of my brain, and I gagged a bit. I noticed others having the same reaction, and this time Stephen had paled to a flat white coffee shade. Turning my head, I saw Salistra walk by the edge of the porch, where not an hour before she had been the size of a large horse, the ones that pulled the bear trucks and commercials. Now, she made an elephant look petite, and with each step the ground shook. Behind her slithered Tersane, her scales catching the light and creating tiny rainbows that bounced off every reflective surface. When she came around the porch, my breathing stuttered, she wore her inhumanly beautiful face, and the number of men that were all but drooling over her would have made me want to giggle if fear hadn't locked everything else out. A subtle shift of my head let me check on Joe, and she just looked terrified but determined, her jaw locked as she stared ahead. Who is in charge here? Salistra's voice cut through my mind like an obsidian blade, and I whimpered, because this time there was fury behind those crystal tones. Mr. Bullhorn Guy spoke through a clenched jaw. I am. You are interfering in an earth legal matter. This doesn't concern you. He spat out the words, and my eyes widened. Is he insane? Salistra didn't say anything, but looked towards the other side of the house, and everyone followed her gaze, including me. Something slithered and crawled and bubbled around the edge of my house, leaving the lawn and pavement behind it melted and rotted. I gagged again, fighting to keep the food in my stomach while more than a few people lost that battle, though Joe and Sable didn't. And to my displeasure, neither did Bullhorn Guy. It had no shape, and all shapes. It was black and all colors and no colors, and it made me want to scream, cry, laugh, and beg all at the same time. I didn't even have to ask. I knew this was the representative of chaos, and I wanted nothing more than to never have it in this realm again. The representatives of magic think otherwise. There have been concerns for a while regarding your treatment of mages, but it is mostly your world. Now, we have an issue with your current actions against a herald of magic. More than one person was bleeding from the nose at this point, including Bullhorn Guy. I thought about saying something, but I had no idea what to say. I wasn't even sure why they were here. That is not your business. Cory Monroe broke the law. She is to be arrested. Point of fact, she did not. The razor-sharp words cut into my mind. By your own laws, they are requested to stay in the area. She remained in your state physically, though she had to step to another realm. Which meant she wasn't reachable. The man snarled. I wondered about his sanity. Salistra's speech cut into your brain, and he was going to challenge her? Did he have a death wish? To rescue those that are like unto family for her, which is grounds for leaving, is it not? Salistra had leaned even closer to the man, her needle-tipped horn less than a foot from his chest. Her voice calm, logical, and so cold I expected the temperature to drop. Bullhorn Guy cast a glance at the three of us on the porch and sneered. I have no proof they were ever in danger. 
Wanting to try on clothes or have a girl's night, or just get naked with your lovers does not constitute extenuating circumstances. I ground my teeth, frustrated and amazed at the man's stubbornness. Oh, I can guarantee you they were in real danger. If Marilyn Monroe had not come and rescued them, both girls would have died. I would have ensured it. Her crystal-sharp voice cut me to the heart as I realized if I had not come, they would have died because of me. Rage began to build again, pushing at my bindings. They were promised to me if she did not show. I would have had fun with them for a long time. I didn't need to know who spoke. The pain and discordant notes made it clear the thing from chaos had replied. I really wanted it to never speak again. More than one person on the lawn was laying there retching, blood oozing from nose and ears. Even Bullhorn looked a bit shaken by that. Humans, trust me, the two women would have died. A long, slow, painful death if Cory had not rescued them. But I do not think you understand the full nature of what we want to make very, very clear to you. Tersane had moved forward. Towering over all the humans, she had to be at least twelve feet tall, and when she turned to look at me, I swallowed at the expression of a stranger wearing a face I knew. This was the face of a demigod, not the Tersane who sat and ate smoked nuts with us. Part of me wondered if this really would cost me everything, and when did I start considering her my friend? The agent struggled to his feet. I was impressed. I didn't want to move, and he was standing. The guy didn't lack for willpower. Most everyone else was sitting, though a few were curled up in the fetal position. And what is that nature? She's a mage? She's under our rules and controls. Bullhorn spat, staring at her. I had the petty thought of really, really wanting her to turn him to stone. Maybe it would help. Yes, and we acknowledge those rules to an extent. Look. Tersane said and waved at the porch where I sat, Carolyn at the bottom step. A rip formed, the slash of pain almost unnoticeable, with the pain from all the other stuff rippling through my mind, and Esmir stepped out. Her coat gleamed like emeralds in the sun, making the grass seem pale and sickly. Another slash of pain and another rip, and Banyarl stepped out, taking a seat on the other side of Carolyn. Along my porch steps, a head, then a body materialized out of them, and Hamadia formed, sitting on the top step, with a bonelessness that made my body ache, even as I tried to remember to close my mouth. A flash of pain came from above me, and I jerked my head to see Georgas fly from nowhere and land on the banister, his feathers so rich in color they didn't look real. What is going on? I shot Joe and Sable a wide-eyed glance, but they looked as confused as I did. It didn't make me feel any better. To make you understand, Corey Monroe is protected, watched over, favorited, and even loved. She is special to magic and to us. While we agree she must abide by your rules, within reason. The last part was said with a level of menace that made my skin crawl. If she is hurt, abused, or killed because you think you're... Petty needs for control is more important. The realms themselves will turn against you. Make very sure anything that befalls her is due to her willing actions to break your laws. This is blackmail. Treat her as a god or we'll punish you. He spat, and the level of spite in his gaze as it lingered on me made me want to step into another realm myself. Whatever else happened here, he was my enemy. How is this my life, that I have an enemy like this? Not at all. We would have removed the edicts at any time. We decided not to. Your world is rather 
Tersing paused, looked around, her lips forming a perfect moo. Boring. This is simply us telling you the consequences of your actions, should you continue forward with them. She has a purpose for us, and we would like to see her achieve it. Or don't let her move forward with her purpose. This world does much I would like to remake. The thing from chaos said, Yes, Bob would enjoy that, though we all have denizens of our realms that would enjoy free access. Bob? That thing's name is Bob now? But I would most definitely come for you. Salistra all but drawled in a honey-coated tone that cut like a knife as her horn touched the agent's chest. For you would have deprived me of a debt that I am owed. For the first time, Bullhorn looked shaken. I will review the charges, and if you swear the woman would have been killed without her presence, then her departure may be deemed acceptable. Excellent. Then I am sure you shall be old and gray before we ever need to step back into this realm. Sal? Bob? Tersane turned in a way that no human body could ever have managed and moved to face me. I trust Corey Munro. You will continue your studies with Mage Elder Banyarl and accept guidance, as always, from Chaos Lord Esmir. Do remember to call upon Georgas as needed for advice and research, especially regarding his late master's work. She winked at me, which did nothing to allay the wholesale panic waiting at the back of my mind. But what was also there was the knowledge that I could take the agents all if I wanted. That I was a dragon. I just needed to grow into my scales. Each of my allies preened or lifted wings or did something to drive home that they were magical creatures, as she called their name. And now she wanted me to speak and be semi-coherent? I kept my focus on her and forced myself to my feet. If that jerk could do it, so could I. Forcing a smile to my face, I performed a shallow bow. I would be honored to continue our associations. My training with Mage Elder Banyarl has been informative so far. From the flicker of a smile on her lips, I knew that was the right thing to say, even if these were politics I never had planned on playing in. And I know your coven members will continue also, she said, turning that inhuman gaze onto Sable and Joe. They had also managed to stagger to their feet. They both bowed, agreeing. We shall be watching. Remember, your rules do not apply to our realms. Tersane's words were cryptic, but I sensed they were meant more for me than anyone else. Understood. The man with the bullhorn ground out. The three beans turned and swept towards the back of the house. Bob left a trail of destruction I knew would take me weeks to restore. And then they were gone. People slowly sat up, and guns were raised and pointed my way. I didn't react. I just stood there like a dragon, surveying my realms, and stared at the interlopers on my lawn. Banyarl, Carolian, Esmir, Georgaz, and Himadia arrayed at my feet. Chapter 42 While familiars amplify the power of their mage, there is no quantitative data on how or if the type of familiar makes a difference. While the occasional familiar will mention being from a specific realm, they don't always match the class of a mage or the primary class of a merlin, and no two offerings are ever the same cost, even if two mages have the same power scheme and the same type of familiar. Magic explained. Put the guns down and help the people still having reactions. And someone check on our mages. They took a pretty big hit. He didn't take his eyes off me, but he dropped the bullhorn and headed my direction. Bullhorn looked at me, his lips pressed in a thin line, and I was very glad I had three, if not four, predators between me and him. Carolian, Esmir, and Banyarl sat in front like an honor guard, 
while Georgaz and Hamadia had taken up spots on either side of the steps, flanking me. Miss Monroe? He ground out, stopping about three feet in front of my friends. I didn't bother to inform him I knew for a fact any of them could cross those three feet before he had time to blink, much less react. Merlin Monroe, if you please. I replied, trying to channel Indira's cool competence. Would you explain what all of this was actually about? You fled the scene of an active murder investigation. Each word sounded like he wanted to spit at me. I pretended I was Esmir and didn't care. No, I corrected, while wishing I was dressed in my new clothes, not beat up and worn down from the trials. I felt disheveled and exhausted, which meant I probably looked worse. I left a police station where the suspect was already in custody and had all but admitted to her actions. The Merlin who was my liaison knew where I was going and had an idea as to why. All they needed from me was a redundant testimony, as there was more than enough evidence. I tried to stay cool and calm, but I made a silent vow to memorize every single law regarding mages on the books. His eyes narrowed. You were told to leave. The law requires you to stay. I was told not to leave by someone who had no authority over me, as I have not entered the draft, and I was present only as a courtesy to my mentor. It was a trial run. There was no real difference between me coming here and going back to the apartment in the city. Corey. Carolyn's voice purred in my mind. Stephen says the law only applies to mages in the draft or formally contracted by the police department. You weren't. You weren't contracted to anyone except the FBI, and this wasn't an official assignment. The fact that they want to try you means they are trying to prove something, and it also means you aren't liable, because otherwise it would be a law you broke, not a trial to try and say you broke a law. I wanted to dance in joy and relief. I was definitely memorizing every single law, and I would make Carolyn memorize them too. I haven't even entered the draft yet. As the police did not contract with me, and this was not an official assignment, while I may have been ethically obligated to stay, I was not legally required. All the laws have clauses for need and the ability to be contacted. I was still in the state, and my location was known. I hoped that would shut him down hard. If anything, he just seemed to get more annoyed. You were not reachable here, and didn't answer your phone. His eyes tried to drill holes into me. Behind him, Indira and Stephen were slowly approaching, and other people were looking decidedly freaked out. More than a few were still gagging or bleeding from Salistra and Bob's mind speech. I clenched my fists so tight my nails cut into my palms, giving me something to focus on besides the complete meltdown I wanted to have. I didn't understand why no one else realized the equivalent of God's had just walked onto my front lawn and said, we like her, be nice to her, or else. With a smile pasted on my face and focusing on the pain from my nails, I responded. I did not know that when I arrived. All I knew was that my friends and roommates were unreachable and had been for days. When Mrs. Guzman called me, I became aware it was more serious than a dead battery or phone. As my ability to assist with the investigation was done... I traveled here. I fully expected to find them with dead phones and goofing off. A mage had crept up behind Bullhorn Man, the sole symbol emblazoned on his temple. You're lying, he said in a flat voice. Bullhorn's eyes narrowed. I heaved an overly exasperated sigh. Joe's muffled laugh told me I'd gone a bit too dramatic. Fine, I was afraid they were dead. I'd hoped they'd had just had their phones die and were too busy having sex to think about me. Both girls choked behind me, and I cast them silent apologies. Now, would you like to explain exactly why, when the mage admitted to her crimes, and you had various other mages that could testify how the victims were killed, you felt you needed to show up here? I knew the answer, but it was time to be a dragon. 
and maybe you should tell me your name. He flushed an ugly red-orange that clashed with his sandy red hair. I am Director Harold Leafon of the Draft Board. I make all the recommendations as to how further policies should be developed to control the abilities of mages and make sure our country is assisted by them, not harmed. When it was reported to me that you had teleported for something so frivolous as to check on friends, the board became concerned, especially when your mentor swore you would contact us shortly. After 24 hours passed, we had reason to believe either you had fractured from your exposure to the insanity of Kelly Warren, or were fleeing for some reason. My mind shouted lie at the last part, and I almost called him out on it, but instead I shut my mouth, thinking fast about how to lie without lying. This house is special, and there are things here that could hurt anyone. I was frantic over my friend's inability to be reached, and I might have overreacted. As it was, they were in danger, but I should have been more polite about my departure. Lifon glanced at the mage next to him, who nodded. Why were you not answering your phone? His tone told me clearly he still thought I was lying, because I left it here as I knew I was probably going to be in another realm. I paused as the mage sucked in air through his teeth. You went to another realm? The mage blurted, looking at me. Lifon looked annoyed at the derailment of his accusations. I gave both of them my best flat dragon stare. You did just see what came and flattened my yard, right? I jerked a finger to the grass that was black and mushy. Where did you think they came from? They wanted me there and insured it by taking my friends. It wasn't like I had cell phone service there. The mage flushed, then paled, and snapped his eyes to the various beings surrounding me. Why were they in danger? Lifon demanded. I tilted my head, staring at him. Why does it matter? Because I need to know if something is affecting my mage's ability to do their service. He snapped back. I haven't started my draft. None of us have. So until day one, it is none of your business. I responded, barely managing to not snap back. Is there anything else? Lifon sneered at my allies and moved closer, eyes not leaving my face. I don't like ultimatums handed down to me by animals from another realm. Be assured, we will be watching you very closely, and if you so much as set a toe over the line, I will be there to make sure you pay the price. I wanted to laugh and cry at the same time. The arrogance of this man astounded me, and I suspected he really did think they were animals. And you can be assured that anything that happens to me will be investigated to the fullest. I can only imagine Bob would be the one doing the questioning. It felt so wrong referring to that thing as Bob, and frankly, there wasn't any other adjective or pronoun to use, but the resulting paling of the mage and Lee Fawn made me feel better, though why Bob would do anything on my behalf made no sense. Esmir stood, and Lee Fawn took a step back as her sighs registered. With a flick of her tail, She walked up the steps to me and took a seat next to me. Corey, hold out your arm. It wasn't a request, and I knew exactly which arm she meant. With a muffled sigh, I pulled up the sleeve of my left arm and exposed the snake and the unicorn horn. Ah, I see. Well, Bob. The emphasis she made on his name was so sarcastic I almost choked on the laugh that burbled up inside me. Is annoy no mark represents chaos, especially as your focus is of chaos. Lifon and the other mages had the blood drained from their faces, their eyes wide as they stared at her. The rest of the people in the area came to a standstill, watching us with sudden interest. Great, she's broadcasting this to everyone. I cannot say that emotion is inaccurate. Let me fix it. She moved her head towards my arm, and I tried not to flinch, expecting another bite. At this rate, my arm was going to look like a full sleeve of tattoos. But instead of biting me, she placed her nose and whiskers against my arm. 
the dampness of her nose cool against my warm skin. A flash of electrical heat centered at the spot and raced a few inches, then faded. She pulled back her muzzle and peered at my arm. Yes, appropriate, I feel, even if it is not what Bob would have wanted. Bracing myself, because Merlin only knew what a calf would think was appropriate, even if I was sure I'd be happier with her choice than with what Bob might have wanted, I looked at my arm. A smile was surprised out of me by what I saw. With the snake from Tursane in the middle and the mini horn from Salastra on my inner side, the outside now held a perfect nose and whiskers etched in a rainbow of colors. It was both pretty and chaotic, and oh, so calf. I lifted my eyes to Esmir watching, an inscrutable look on her calf face. I love it. I rather thought you might, very appropriate for the mage my kit chose. Esmir, as if she was all too aware of the audience she had gathered, turned to look at the people on the lawn. I shall see you later, Merlin Monroe. We have much to discuss about your new role as the Herald. With that, she leapt up, deadly power personified, right towards Director Li Fon and disappeared. There wasn't even a ripple to indicate whether she'd sidestepped or went into another realm. The man flinched back, arms blocking an attack to his head. He straightened when nothing impacted him and snarled at me. You told her to do that, he accused. I laughed, as did Carolyn, Bainerl, and Yorgas. She's a cat. I don't tell her to do anything. I pointed out at the same time as Carolyn, still with an undertone of amusement in his mind voice, spoke. No one tells my Malkin what to do. The last one that tried ended up feeding her for a month. Lifon stared at everyone, grinding his jaw. Be careful. Dental repairs are expensive. I said, my voice coated with sugar. Okay, I probably shouldn't have said that, but damn it, I was teetering on exhaustion as I had been up for a long time, and my body was complaining. His hands clenched, and I just knew he wanted to be looming over me, trying to make me see how insignificant I was. But I had allies, and I knew I had a dangerous game to play, and I couldn't start out seeming weak. Watch yourself, Monroe. Just because you think your animal friends will help you, don't think that means you can fill out the rules. I can't wait for you to screw up, and I'll be the one to cut off your head. If he'd been any closer to me, I'm sure I would have had his spittle on my face. Please let him be gone by the time my draft starts. Don't worry. I plan on making sure I follow every single rule, and then some. Now please, to find someplace else to be. I added a bit of anger to that and looked at the tire tracks in the lawn, the trash they dumped, and the huge hoof marks from Salastra. One last glare raked across the three of us, pretending Bainyarl and Georgaz didn't exist. Then he spun on his heels and stalked across my lawn, each step an extra hard stomp. Jerk, I muttered. I watched the crowd of people pick up and go, though the mages lingered the longest, looking at Banyarl and Georgaz with strange expressions of lust and curiosity. Everyone, except the power-mad director, had a freaked-out look and kept jumping at every sound or sudden movement. Banyarl had way too much fun flapping open his wings and scaring them. Andira and Stephen waited until the majority of the people had packed up before making their way up to the porch, both still a bit pale. They looked at Banyarl, Georgaz, Himadia, and then at me. Maybe we should talk, Stephen said, his voice more polite than I'd ever heard. Chapter 43 Covens are interesting legal entities. They are not marriages or corporations, yet they fall in between. While U.S. law requires two adults for marriage, covens are governed by the OMO and only require all members be mages. While there are no minimum or maximum for a coven, generally they act like a family group 
and are treated as a small company. They file a declaration very similar to an LLC, and any children are legally children of all partners of the LLC. While communal living is not required, it is common. History of Magic Sable and Joe went to drag their chairs out back. Bane Jarl was a bit too big to comfortably fit through the doors. I knew I was past exhausted, but this couldn't be put off until later. Georgas still hadn't said much to me, and I walked over to him while the others were headed around back and asked, Everything okay? He gave me a long look, his tail rustling in the breeze. James said once there was an ancient Babylonian curse. May your life never have boredom and always challenge you. I fear you have been cursed in such a way. The avalanche has started, and neither you nor I have the power to stop it. I wonder if either of us will live to see it come to fruition. Call if you need me, Corey. He vanished in a flash of fire and air, his departing words leaving me even more worried. I went through the house, grabbing a cold Coke from the fridge. I needed the sugar and the caffeine. I knew when I laid down, I'd be out, but I couldn't do it quite yet. The chairs were arranged in a semicircle, with Banyarl, Hamadia, and Carolyn closing the circle. I sank down into the empty chair and just looked at all of them. Well, dragon I might be, but right now I was a tired dragon and liable to bite someone's head off. I wondered if heads were tasty with ketchup while trying to focus on staying awake for this. Indira licked her lips. Would you mind telling us what happened? The wrist with the mark of magic on it pulsed once, and I sighed. I stalled, taking another slow sip of Coke and tried to speak to Hamadia. Hamadia? Yes, master. Her voice sounded like wind in the trees, and I closed my eyes wanting to sleep so bad. Ugh, no, don't call me master. Just Cory. I'm going to blame you for the tests. Magic doesn't want me to share the Herald stuff. Is that okay? Of course. I am yours now. Okay. We will have a very long talk about that later. Himadia just looked away and didn't say anything. Apparently, you need to be worthy to own this house. I blame James. So there were a series of trials that Hamadia had administered. It wasn't a lie, quite, and Stephen didn't call me on it. I explained what happened and Salstra's annoyance with me, hence the marks, then Tersane's one-upmanship. Everyone, even Banyarl, listened as if I was telling the greatest story of all time, I didn't go as in-depth with the challenges as I did with Joe, Sable, and Carolyn, just skimming them and focusing more on the outcome. Then we show up here, and that idiot is outside yelling. I swallowed and looked at them. Did I really mess up that much? Thanks for the info, by the way. Stephen held Indira's hand tight, and he looked older for some reason. Yes, you skated by, barely because I stayed and the city had contracted me, not you. But Corey... He hesitated, looking at Banyar and Georgas. I don't know if bringing them here was a brilliant move or if you just shot yourself. I started to laugh, as did Banyar and Georgas. I was about to fall out of my chair with exhaustion amplified giggles. As powerful as Corey is, I believe you give her too much credit. Banyar spoke, his voice rich as always. Tersain requested that I consider showing myself to mortals and establish that I was her teacher. I've been aware of the plans in motion for a very long time and deemed it worthy of the attention. Though when I agreed, I had not been aware that Esmir or Georgas would be on display also. He ruffled out his wings a little before settling back down. I fought a smile. Banyarl disliked having the attention pulled away from him, and few could compete with a phoenix. And Esmir had her own level of fascination for humans. Wait, you're really a teacher? For how long? 
I almost started laughing again at the sputtering astonishment from Stephen. Since the day I took both of you to my home, after eliminating the humans that were hunting you. Bainerl had a level of smugness to his voice that sounded too much like Carolyn. And how long have you been waiting to tell him that? I asked as I tried to crush the last of my giggles. At least a year, Bainerl admitted. There were many Things your instructor passed on that contained so many levels of inaccuracy, it was painful. You killed the sniper on the roof, Indira hissed, her eyes wide. But I looked, I couldn't see you. You mean like this? Bainerl shimmered and vanished. Okay, he makes it look so much cooler than when I did it, Joe said, staring at the dented grass though doing it on grass is a giveaway. Wait, you can do that too. Stephen's head rotated to stare at Joe. Kinda. I'm still there if you know to look. She tilted her head, and the air shimmered around her, and she disappeared. But if you stared really hard, you could see a vague distortion in her outline, like a heat haze. A minute later, she shimmered back into view. See? He's much better at it. I have also been practicing for a century or more, Bainerl said from thin air. He's been teaching all of you? Indira's voice cracked, and I had to admit part of me enjoyed seeing her calm composure fractured. It wasn't a nice part of me. I swore not to tell anyone, but apparently Tursane decided I didn't need to keep it quiet. Bainerl reappeared, his wings shifting. The need for covert actions is gone. He shifted and settled in, giving me a sideways look. It was a better use of resource to declare. I'm both jealous and in awe. You had actual other realm denizens acting as teachers. Indira just looked stunned. We all have. It's kind of cool everything Earth doesn't understand, Sable said laughing softly as water came up from her glass and swirled around her. So why did they come? Stephen asked. You know they will pin me down as soon as they can ask. Other than to prevent me and my friends from being killed? I don't know. I don't know what their plans are. I don't know why Tursain seems to think I'm a friend. I don't know why Salastro hasn't killed me. And as for Bob? I glared at Carolyn. Bob? Well, every time we said... A spike of pain slammed down through my eyes and out my ears, and I whimpered. Everyone reacted like that, Carolyn said, exasperation in his voice. I pried my eyes open to see the rest of the humans also reacting, like someone had shoved a flaming dagger into their brain. Bob works, I muttered. I cleared my throat. (laughs) Ahem. When I figure it out, and I think it is safe to tell you, I will. For now, I looked at everyone inside. (sighs) I know I've made an enemy, but I still have three or four years before I'm done with my degree, so maybe he'll be gone. I need to learn every single law and have it memorized. I need to learn how to use my magic offensively. Falling back on Earth every time causes way too much collateral damage. I felt a twinge of guilt at the memory of Daniela Morris's death, but it faded quickly. I hadn't meant for her to die. That sounds like fun. It has been a while since I have dug out my war spells, but I did not think humans used them. Banyarl had both enthusiasm and curiosity in his voice. I just shrugged. We don't know of any, or at least none are freely talked about. I provided a list of some to Corey, but they are a shadow of what you know. Stephen looked at Georgas, who had done little but listen. He just shook his head. And to think we prided ourselves as mentors, when you had these people in your court. And when did you get on a first-name basis with Tursing? Um, my birthday, probably. She showed up, said she likes cake. I shrugged. And I don't know that she has more than one name. You know, like Cher. And Bob and Selstra? Stephen asked. I just shrugged. You'd have to ask them. I held up my arm. The snake is to show Tursane is aware of or intrigued by me. 
The horn is because I pissed Salister off, and she says I owe her. We all sat in silence for a few minutes. Then Indira started giggling. I looked at her funny. What? Corey, you just intimidated and forced one of the more powerful men in the U.S. to back down. Indira shook her head, still smiling. I know the Alma was going to be taking notes, and you can expect constant requests for information about the beans that showed up. You've made an enemy in him. He doesn't tolerate losing well. Yet, you have more power behind you and in you than any mage I've ever heard of. And we thought we were mentoring you. Corey, you've so far surpassed what we've hoped we could do. Merlin, I'm about to ask you to mentor me. List you as one of my sponsors and maybe see if that gets people off my back. Oh, I murmured, concentrating on my feet, not sure how to answer that. I just wanted to quit being the timid mouse, but now I was starting to realize that maybe I'd gone too far. All of you will need to watch your step. Joe and Sable, that includes you too. They will try to get you to make a mistake in order to get their claws into Corey. So be very careful, as you'll start the draft before Corey does. Stephen said, his voice serious. I'd follow her lead in memorizing the laws. You're going to need to know how fine those laws are at times. He shrugged. But I'm wondering what the three of you are going to change. Everyone looked at us, and we looked at each other and shrugged. I jerked up straight. Himadia! She flinched, as did half the people in the yard. I ignored them. The books! Were the books real? Joe and Sable knew what I meant, though I hadn't described the books when I reviewed what happened. Books? Stephen asked, but I ignored him, focused only on Himadia. She shifted. Yes and no. The death book is real. It is a list of all deaths and why but it only shows you either people you know or someone you are seeking, she said, her voice low. It is written by magic as every being dies. I pushed that down. Someday I would figure out why Stevie died. It wasn't worth Joe or Sable's life. But the others? Yes. If a cure is known, it is listed there. But until a cure to a disease has been discovered, it is never listed. So only diseases we already know how to treat would be there? Hamadia looked at the sky. Mostly. There are some things you have forgotten, or the necessary ingredients have disappeared. But yes. I sagged. And the magic items? Disappointment pulling at me hard enough that sleep surged back up as a priority. Oh, real. But then replicating those only takes a... Corey. Did you mention forming a coven? Are the three of you going to bond, then? Bainerl's question distracted me, and Himadia faded a bit into the grass, looking greener than before. A coven? Are you going to officially form one? Indira asked, seemingly delighted. That gave me a jolt of worry. I looked at Bainerl and Georgaz, then shifted to Carolian, who was licking his paw and washing his face. We're still discussing it. Joe and Sable gave me startled looks, then smiled, their hands clasped. Someday we would talk about it, just not today. I had no idea what I'd started or what it would involve by the time it was done. But I was Magic's Herald now, and I'd make sure I was enough of a dragon to protect my friends and family. And with Joe and Sable on my side, plus Carolian, a griffin a phoenix, and maybe a chaos lord, whatever that meant, I might just end up being a very scary dragon. Here's to being a dragon, and finally getting some sleep. Appendix. Magic Symbols. Chaos. Entropy. Fire. Water. Time. Order. Pattern. Air. Earth transform. Spirit, soul, relativity, non-organic, psychic. Author Notes This is Book 4 in Twisted Luck, based in the Turnian universe, 
I have so much more planned that I can't wait to show you. If you loved this novel, please take the time to leave a review. You will be amazed at the difference it makes. There is a lot more coming. I'm writing as fast as I can. If you'd like to stay in touch, you can follow me on social media at the following places. Website, badashpublishing.com. Facebook, facebook.com slash badashbooks. Twitter, twitter.com slash badashbooks. Instagram, instagram.com slash badashbooks. Bookbub, bookbub.com slash profile slash Mel Todd. If you're interested in free books, keeping up with what is going on in my life, as well as sales and launch announcements, you can sign up for my newsletter at my website. You never know what freebies might show up. Take care. Mel Todd. Mel Todd has over 20 stories out. Her urban science fiction, Kalid Chronicles, the Blood War series, and the new Twisted Luck series. Owner of Bad Ash Publishing, she is working to create a place for excellent stories and great authors. With over a million words published, she is aiming for another million in the next two years. Bad Ash Publishing specializes in stories that will grab you and make you hunger for more. With one co-author and more books in the works, her stories can be found on Amazon and other retailers.